Uh, I'm back with my co-host, International Master Casa Corley. Casa, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm good, Matt. Good to be with you again. Um, you know, it's funny. We actually had uh, a brunch um, this weekend on Saturday, and I actually it totally escaped me that something happened to your eyes. So it must have gotten progressively worse over the course of. Uh, you know, a few days, I guess. I think I'm still riding the endorphin high of having just sparred and being able to feast with you. We each, uh, sh should I should I divulge our secret? We each, we, we each got two entrees at brunch. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't usually do that. That's kind of gluttonous. Yeah, but it was so, so good, man. Um, but I'm excited. We Week one, PCL in the books. We get to go over some incredible games this week, starting with a weekly re review, a recap. Uh, but... I, what did you think? Just like, uh, you know, knee jerk reaction from all the action that we had this week. It was a lot of fun to watch. Um, obviously the format being 10 minutes, uh, uh, two second delay, the games are pretty fast paced. There's a lot of talent all over the league. Um, there were a, a ton of upsets um, that we're gonna, and we're gonna recap some of them. And we have some really special guests this week uh, to help us do that. So uh, really, really excited to get into it with you. So. I guess we'll we'll start. We have a puzzle to start with, just to kind of get people kind of revved up um, for what we're gonna we're gonna go through. A little appetizer, if you will, and then we'll introduce uh, our first guest. Right? I think that's how how we're gonna proceed here. Yeah, let's do it. So actually, uh, should we bring on our our guest to go into the puzzle? together uh yes does, does yes. that work okay we awesome shall. so so uh I, I, everyone from my stream already knows this uh this chess boxing champion and women's grandmaster uh but today we have none other than D dina belankaya with us for the checkout show our third episode uh we did try to uh make it work with um an earlier episode she was actually gonna be our first guest and uh, and we finally got to got to uh, make it work for this one, which I'm super excited about. So, Dina, uh, what's up? Good to see you. How are you? Hello, hello. I'm great. How are you? Doing great. Uh, so, Casa prepared an awesome puzzle for us, um, and we want to give our our viewers a chance to uh, to dig into it. So, I know you can probably find the answer super quick, but uh, in chat. Just as a reminder, we do a giveaway for Chess.com memberships with uh, each Checkout Show episode. If you want to enter, you can enter in uh, your answer for the puzzle with a highlighted message. That will get you uh, an extra entry. Um, and then uh, if it's correct, we'll give you an extra entry on top of that. So um, Casa, is, uh, this is the, the puzzle pulled up already. Uh, go ahead and start studying it. And, uh, and Casa, do you wanna take it away? Yeah, so basically it's white to move. Um, you know, black has a pawn that's going to soon become a queen. So we have to, we there have to operate with some urgency here. Um, some real urgency to figure out how to kind of thwart black's intentions here. And, um, yeah, it's not one move long. So actually, if you, if you have an idea, it's really, you have to give a, a variation. Um, hopefully, uh, it won't, it won't be, it won't, it won't be a super, super long variation, but enough to sort of prove that you you get the point that white is actually the one that can actually come out on top here. So um, I guess the way I work through puzzles, like the way my brain works, um, I normally start by like counting the material. Like it's like kind of like the basic thing that I start out with. Mm -hmm. And so I see that I'm up a, up four points of Bishop and a pawn, but that this pawn's out to Queens. So then I go through checks, captures, and threats. And I, I tend to kind of do it really methodically because my tactical skills have always been a bit um, behind my other abilities, if you will. So I don't know how you would approach this one, Dina, but uh, I, I like to go through things super methodically and then, ho and then hopefully discover something that works. Um, some people, do you have like a process? All right, so first thing that comes to my mind when I see an endgame puzzle is that, is that a puzzle? Or is that a, uh, a study? Because when it's a study, usually, like, okay, we know that it's always... Uh, I also see that it's fight to move, right? So when it's a study, you kind of like, okay, so it must be it must be a win, yeah? It cannot be a draw here, you know? Or you can also see that because there is an extra bishop. And uh, um, 
yeah it did take me like a couple of seconds i think to to understand what was going on usually when i face such kind of positions you know first question that comes to my head is where do pawns move do pawns move like black mm. do they move up or down this is i I'm don't gonna, know if you guys i'm gonna have just that draw this for people yeah that's a good point so yeah this pawn is going this way and these pawns are going this way um so that, that's actually always a good question. Where do the pawns move, Matt? Because if the pawns are going another way, like the evaluation would be actually be totally different. Oh yeah, that's so, an important one. Fair point, yeah. Um, but it sounds like you kind of know what's going on, Dina. Matt, do you, do, you have, do you have an idea here? Or should we like start to walk through it together? So let, let's start walking through it together. Um, I, okay. I have a hunch, but I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear, uh, hear from the masters. Sure. So. Kind of by process of elimination, there aren't a ton of great choices. Like like we said, black is, is trying to queen on the next move, so white has to be fast. And the problem is both of our pawns right now can't really move, right? So if we try to play b7, black just takes takes the pawn. And if we uh, we can't push the a pawn because it's obstructed. So really it's like, wh what can we do that's gonna be threatening enough to deter black from queening? And then, you know, essentially, um, there aren't that many moves that you come up with, but Dina, I think you might uh, might already see the the first move here. Yeah. So the first thing that comes to my mind is like obviously, as you like, yeah, as you said, and you see that there 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 is no way to stop the queen. Is that what can we do instead, right? Uh, because Black wants to promote. So should be. Um, should we try to promote ourselves or should we do something more decisive when we want to try to promote it's kind of like a, what would happen in the best case in the best case we would just both have queens and how would we win yeah it doesn't work so that means that we need to go for something else something better what else can be better than promoting well and there we go it's a checkmate so we need to go after the king and this is how we try to see where's the mating net so yeah so the mating net so really I noticed that if I protect this pawn and also take away black's uh, b5 square, then the I actually do get to threaten mate. So if I bring my king to a4 or to b4, I'm actually threatening bishop c8 and mate. But then the question is, what's the difference? And if I bring my king to b4, there's this really problematic difference that e1 queen is actually a check. And so if I go king before e1 queen, I, we can't have that because then I don't I don't get to play bishop c8 and mate. So the first move has to be king a4. Now, this is where it gets interesting because bishop c8 is now mate. So if black actually queens here, bishop c8 is mate, right? So right. It, now black actually has to deal with that mate and play king b7 to get out of it because that's the only way to stop the bishop c8 mate. And now we get to play with a theme known as opposition. And this is... Uh, this is always one of my favorites. Um, it's kind of, I always think about it like basketball. Like when you're, I told you about this last week, when we were talking about shouldering. People say, talk about shouldering and opposition. I think about boxing out. Cause when you're getting a rebound in, bo bo in basketball, you got to box someone out, like get all up in their, in their grill a little bit. And we can do that here by playing King B5. By lining mm. up this King on B5 against the King on B7, we have the ability to advance our pawn further with tempo, with checks. And so, uh, black it kind of becomes at our mercy, and um, I think you could finish this finish us off here, Matt. Because after e1 queen, this queen is on the board. Everything has to be with checks, or we lose. So, what check appeals to you here, Matt? If we can get the if we can get those those pawns up the yellow brick road, you know, <laughs> then we uh, we win the game. So so first our candidate moves right. So we we have pawn a6 check, and we have mm -hmm. uh, uh, bishop c8 check. Mm -hmm. So between those two, uh, you know, what, what, wh which is better? Um, well, I, I think that moving the A pawn advances our pawn chain that we need in order to, uh, to promote our queen. So I would, I would move pawn A6. Right you, right you are, Harry. Oh, thank goodness. And points right. the Gryffindor. <laughs> uh, but yeah, A6 check is, is correct. The king can't go to C8 because the bishop is covering. And so now the king has to remain in the corner where we're going to get a tempo either way. Mm. Uh, let's say for uh, for the sake of uh, you know being tenacious, uh, black actually plays king b8. Now we can go with uh, we can go with tempo again um, and play a7 check. Then the king has to slide up in the pocket. If the king goes to the corner. 
we have a really nice bishop g2 dynamic there that's uh mate. not quite mate but it's just about the queen can get in the way and then bishop takes d5 is mate so the king has to step up and then again we can hit them with tempo hit that black king with tempo with bishop d g2 check and now finally we're actually going to get our queen ourselves and when the king goes back to c8 a8 queen comes with check and we've done all this with check and we still have a b pawn and my brain immediately wants to be trade that we once we uh we queen the we make our own queen to solve the b pawn is to trade queens and we can actually uh probably force that um in short order with something like queen c6 check and then eventual queen e4 check and essentially um that's a really bad arrow uh wow uh but <laughs> but essentially white winds up winning the game because they have this this pawn that uh is the kind of their the second pawn that's comes through and it's the saving grace so if you saw all that there's a reward in store for you did did, did, did we did we get anyone in the chat yeah that, so that so of? pudding snack had the right idea so shout out to, to pudding snack and then hdf was also uh along the right lines uh, he was looking at that bishop c8 move which i was also considering like you know get can we can we stall here with something like this but uh but yeah really cool puzzle thanks for finding that casa yeah look i mean i'm not i'm i'm not really a puzzle guy it's it's really kind of embarrassing that you know I don't work on my tactics enough, but I think this one had real practical value. And at the end of the day, you know, Dina was mentioning, hey, these things sometimes can be like, these studies can be super unreasonable or what, what, what not. This was not a study. This was like very realistic in a way. Um, so, right, is that fair to say, Dina? Yeah, totally. And uh, I um, I was wondering, like, why should we stop right here? I would continue a little bit and see, like, like when I approach this puzzle from far, I'm like, I okay, but we haven't won yet, right? We still have a bishop, uh, and that's only a bishop, right? So, um, like, extra bishop and the pawn. Okay, but how do we win? And I think we should go a couple of more moves in advance. And the fact, if we continue the line, well, you always look for the most force, like, force moves first like candidates so it's checks and captures yeah we mm -hmm. have like checks here we have many checks but when it comes to like the bishop coming to c6 and now the king has to move either to d6 or to e7 and the idea is to win the queen so let's say black tries to a little bit more um hold on and then after queen e8 we win the queen and I really think that sometimes it can be confusing to those who solve the puzzles. Let's say if king e7, that we still have queen e8. It can be confusing sometimes when we don't, when we can't calculate till the end. And I'm not sure that many, like, instantly would say, okay, so here the, the, the position is over. Yes, like, they would still continue, like, asking themselves, okay, but how do I win? Yeah, if you just push the pawn, then there will be so many checks. So... I don't know. Maybe it's the only way here to continue bishop c6. Maybe there are others. Yeah, it's funny you mention that because I I definitely did cut it cut it cut it short, mainly in the interest of all these great games we have to look at. But the job is definitely not done, and it's true. Like just because you're up material doesn't mean you're going to necessarily win the game. And my gosh, are we going to see some examples of that today? Like it's ridiculous <laughs> the examples we're going to see where this is shown. You actually point out something that made me immediately think I have to mention this. So this bishop c6 move you mentioned is very savvy because it wins the queen, but there's actually stalemating ideas that, you know, you got to kind of be aware of. Like oh, yeah. if uh, I was like a little bit worried because something like this, like king e6, uh, if if king, if, if uh, king e6 actually, or queen e8, yeah, then king d6 and then queen takes e1. And my gosh, this is actually stalemate. And so you can even mess it up even this far in the, to the line. Oh and so for me, my mindset always when I'm already up material is actually to just just trade. Don't even try to win stuff, just trade. And so I wasn't even considering bishop c6. I was looking at queen c6 and I was just trying to get the king to the e file um, with something like queen d5 uh, because I thought if I was if I was able to do that, it was uh, it was going to be kind of easy peasy end of the game clean up on all five type of business and uh yeah that's kind of my sanity check always is just get just get the queens off the board and life becomes a lot easier <laughs> simplify so, simplify 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 yeah and if uh and if the king stepped to the side to c8 then we'd have b7 check and then we'd have these 
checkmating patterns coming to the fore again. If the king steps aside, we can even entertain two queens. What's better than one queen? Maybe two queens. So <laughs> Isn't uh, that so right, they, Josephine? <laughs> We're going to so, get to a, a little two queen action later, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, let's move on from the puzzle. That puzzle was uh, hopefully pretty useful, but let's actually do a bit of a tour around the league to talk about what happened in week one of the of the Pro Chess League. There were some really, really interesting games, interesting moments, and there are eight different matchups. So what I'm basically going to do is pull out a snippet from each matchup that basically told the uh, basically told a story about how the how the how the teams actually played and how it went. And then uh, our very last matchup is going to ultimately feature our our guests. So uh, very much looking forward to that. So anyway, can I take us on a tour around the league, Matt? Uh, I'm so excited. Dina? Yeah, cool. we, so, we got spoiled this week. Let's do it. All right. So uh, week one. So the first match I want to take us through was actually the, the Tuesday slate last week. There are games, two games on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday uh, every week. And the first uh, matchup was between the Indian Yogis and the Brazilian Capybaras. And this was actually uh, round one of that matchup uh, between uh, Vaishali R, um, um, very, very talented uh, uh, player from India. I think sometimes she's she can be known as, uh, sometimes she's known as Prague's sister, but frankly, <laughs> she's a super talented player in her own right. And Prague's sister just doesn't do her justice. And in the first round, she completely demolished this GM from the Brazilian Capybaras. And we have this fun position on the board where they're just a lot of pawns. <laughs> like there are a lot of pawns. And so um, there are a lot of ways to kind of, uh, you know, I, what's what's the expression? Um, there's many ways to skin a cat. I've never skin understood that expression. Yeah, I don't get that one either. Why would you skin a cat? I have no <laughs> idea. It's it's one of, Dina, it's this really weird American expression. I, I don't understand who came up with it. But that's what people say. There are many yeah, ways those to slice American up, slice expressions. Up here. I had a lot of experience with them for the last two months. Yeah. So my apologies in advance for the weird ones, because there are a lot of weird ones. Um, and this is one of them. But the game was really brilliant. Um, and in this position against uh, Luis Paolo, um, Vaishali played rook b7, giving up the knight, saying, take my knight. I have pawns that are about to make it to the promised land. So please take my knight. And Luis uh, Paolo was like, eh, I, I don't think I, I'm gonna, be I believe you, I can't take the knight because after rook takes e5, something like rook b8 check and c7 would be devastating. So instead of taking the knight, uh, black actually went back to f6. And here, I think most humans would probably defend the knight. Um, at least most of our folks watching probably defend the knight. Matt, you see a knight attacked, I'd hope you defend it. You know, it's it's just the chess 101. Uh, yeah, you can't count on me for that all the time, but but that's okay. the, that's definitely the the correct play. All right. Well, Vaishali, she was like, I don't need the knight. I got pawns, baby. D6. Those are beautiful pawns. Connected passers, as we like to call them. And after rook takes e5, d7, it's just a wrap. The one of these pawns is making it home. And uh yeah, the game didn't last much longer. Rook a8. Rook c7, rook e8, oof, giving up a rook for a pawn like that, not pretty. And then in this position, up a million pawns, uh, eventually uh, uh, the black player went down. And that this matchup was basically told the story of the, of the day because the Indian yogis wound up winning. What was the store score of this match? They, they wound up winning eight and a half, three and a half. So this was like blowout territory. And it's funny because we had, we're talking, we'll talk about the PCL predictions later. I was saying there's no way there's going to be any blowouts because there are just too many good players and, you know, it's just not going to happen. This was a blowout, Matt. So the Indian yogis are a team that we're going to really have to, uh, to be aware of, keep a lookout for, because this was, this was crazy. This was, this was like, yikes <laughs> powerhouses from the east definitely a team to look out for and and uh and, and funny joke from from chat johnny says the indian yodis didn't play any moves because they're pacifists obviously didn't watch the pcl but uh funny pulling <laughs> pulling uh some yogic theory into it uh <laughs> i love it 
do you, Dina, do you know anything about Vaishali? Have you ever played her before? I've actually seen her. Uh, we played in the same tournaments before because um, I played a little bit in, in Europe the last few years. And um, yeah, and, um, she's been really, really uh, improving the last few years, I feel like. I believe she played for, for, for the third Indian team at the Olympiad, if I'm, I'm not mistaken. But yeah, I've seen her around a lot, uh, especially even like already last year and two years before when uh, there have been uh, several uh, women's speed chess championships on chess.com. I've commentated those and Vershali would always be, you know, on the top uh, positions. And I watched a lot of her games. I've covered them myself. And uh, yeah, she, she's very promising and she... Uh, uh, I believe she's going to be uh, very soon the national team number one of India. I wouldn't be surprised to that. And well, when you come from a chess family, what else uh, do you expect? <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, it's funny, though. It's it's like, you know, at the end of the day, nothing is nothing is given. You know what I mean? You act, you have to earn it. And, and I think that's the thing that comes to mind, too, is like it's it could be a blessing to be a, come from a family like that. It can also be a curse, right? And it, it really depends on how you kind of capitalize on it. Um, Matt, you're going to jump in there? Yeah, Dina knows all about that. Also coming from a chess family, her mother being her chess coach. Yeah, yeah I actually that's did, true. I actually <laughs> did do some uh, some Wikipedia diving earlier this week. And I, I read that your mom was the one of the first coaches of Anish Giri. Is that, was that correct? Yeah, that's uh, that's very precise. And yeah, it was uh, partially it was uh, thanks to my mom that then you stayed in chess because uh, his parents back at that time did not uh, uh, d did not feel the you know the the potential of of the chess that could bring to a person. You know, usually you want your kid to go to school and not you know play the tournament. So there would always be this fight between you know the coach feeling that the student has the potential to be the next world champion and the parents who are like you know be concerned that the, their child doesn't go to school too much so yeah it's and yeah my mom is a chess coach up to today actually right now no actually right now it's too late but yeah she's she she she, she gives classes at the um at the olympic school for sports in back in saint i mean back yeah back in saint petersburg and well she was my coach maybe until i was 10 frankly starting from 10 I already like you know both to the to the next uh uh, coach who who also was a niche coach uh, when he was back in our club before he moved to uh, the Netherlands. But yeah, coming from a chess family, summarizing the the point, uh, um, it definitely you need to uh, to be involved yourself, to be motivated, to be hardworking, to be having a talent. And I would say that champions, it's kind of you know mix of all. Your family supporting you, you having a talent, and you being extremely hardworking. Also having a competitive mindset. Mm, yeah, so I guess the first things first, you welcome Anish, right? <laughs> like that's like uh, Mama Belenkaya's uh, was definitely instrumental there. And then, uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with uh, a lot of what you said. So, um, yeah. All right, this next matchup, we're going to go to the next matchup. The, the second matchup on uh, last Tuesday was actually between my, I'm kind of like an, an alumnus of the team, the, the Charlotte Cobras and the uh, Canada chess bras. And this was as close as it can get. It was eight and a half, seven and a half to uh, uh, with the chess bras winning it. And we're going to take one game that basically told the story of this match, extremely heartbreaking game um, between a wonder Liang and Magnus Carlson. And uh, a wonder was really doing his thing. Um, he, you know, he basically got a nice attacking position out of the French. Magnus was a little bit too, um, too casual you know i think sometimes you know you're you're a big rating favorite you know you're you're kind of moving through the games pretty cleanly he had some uh pretty nice games before this one and this one uh a wonder had a really nice attack and he was able to kind of carry it out nearly to the finish line with this move queen h7 check king f8 queen takes h6 check you know these are all checks by the way that's you know it's like pow pow, pow. these are this is the equivalent of blows in boxing that's like mm mm Mm. Oh, we know those. Yeah, I know about those. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, got, I've got a few checks this weekend. <laughs> well, yeah, is that's why you're hiding from us from yeah um from far by the camera? <laughs> yeah, 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 uh, yeah, bring it. You gotta your face is uh, as yeah. Little, you gotta bring yourself bigger, Matt. Ma ma make the camera anyone. bigger. I don't wanna. I don't wanna force it. All these, no, no, no. Guys. Make <laughs> the camera my size. I wanna. I wanna see it better. <laughs> So Make yourself closer to us. He was doing some sparring at the gym. And, you are uh, way too far got, from us. Hit, but anyway, so Queen Nick's H6 check. 
Killer. Uh, the reason it's such a killer is because the king can't go back to G8 because of this mating pattern you see sometimes. I don't know the name for it. Um, it's very similar to the one I showed you last week, Matt. The X marks the spot one. Oh, yeah. Where the bishop and queen kind of team up, but it's not an X this time. Um, Dina, for your edification here, is like, what, what is Casa talking about? I like to call this mate where like there's like a pawn on F6 or like a bishop on F6 and the queen there. I like to call like the X marks the spot because it's kind of like it's like kind of making an X. So here there's this bishop H7 check move that's just really strong. And if the king has to go to the corner, there's a discovery which results in a checkmate. Oh, no, it's not quite a checkmate. F8. It's not almost yet. a checkmate. But, but I will say it's bishop takes F7 just wins, basically, because the bishop is essentially pinned because the queen is on B6. Mm -hmm. So not a checkmate, but devastating nonetheless. Um, Anyways, what happened and what is basically forced is the king has to go to e7. And I think this is what Magnus missed from afar. He kind of thought that the king could scurry away here, that there was rook h8 hitting the queen on h6 and the king in h2. And out for like a bolt from the blue, pow, <laughs> rook takes e5, hitting this king on e7, taking advantage of the fact that this queen on b6 is compromised unprotected so black can't recapture and i think everyone watching from here is like oh it's a rat it's a rat black's gonna lose magnus is gonna lose um and it looked that way because the king has to go to d7 bishop b5 comes with check that's another devastating check the king moves and then basically the dust settles and white is up and exchange and it's i mean this is a winning position this is as winning as a position gets and what happened next was just truly heartbreaking. Dina, I don't know if you saw this finish, but this was heart. Okay, yeah, Dina's like, yeah, I saw this. Totally <laughs> heartbreaking. Um, yeah. So queen of eight happened. And after king c7, usually they teach you when you're up material, you should trade. So, uh, you know, a wonder being this strong grandmaster, he was like, well, I, I guess I should trade then, right? But it turns out the way he traded was a little bit sloppy it allowed basically black to get back in the game with this move queen takes f7 check because after this exchange of queens all of a sudden the a pawn is the strongest pawn on the board mm. and um yeah. yeah i mean it's i mean dina we've all been here before in our games we have right oh yeah oh yeah yeah <laughs> Well, you know, chess is painful. Chess is chess can be very, very painful, very heartbreaking, and very, you know, sometimes very cruel. That's how I would put it. The funny thing is, is you know, sometimes mistakes happen, Matt, and you know, maybe you can also in boxing, basketball. I'm a basketball guy. Boxing, it, these things happen, and you have to adjust, right? And I think a lot of times it's about how quickly you can adjust to the new situation because this isn't a position that. Uh, white can't do something in, it's just uh, much more challenging. And I think a wonder didn't adjust the new situation quickly enough because he went rook a5, which is fine. And after bishop e3 went g4 and it seemed like maybe he'd adjusted enough, like the king was gonna maybe come to the center and get involved. But uh, Magnus being the the wily veteran he is, you know, and I can call him a veteran now, he's kind of old these days. <laughs> oh, but, don't uh, say that, there yeah. is no wage for chess. <laughs> oh well he'll he admits it himself he uh he, he the man said he the man is don't listen to that toxic man <laughs> he talks about these young players he's playing these days and i think that's part of what actually keeps his interest up frankly than playing the players he's played over and over and over and over over uh over, across the the last 10 to 15 years um but uh i think you know I think there's some wily vet instincts there. I mean, to pull this out of the hat says something about your resilience and about your tenaciousness and all that. Mm -hmm. Anyways, so B6, rook A7. The rook has to stay on the A file to at least deal with this pawn. King C6, F4. I'm moving quickly because we have other games to look at. Basically, white tries to make a passer while black tries to create, to cement their own. And I think, unfortunately, what a wonder failed to realize, he thought just shoving the G-pawn was going to be a winner, when in actuality, he needed to bring his king over much, much sooner than he did. And, you know, they tell us in the end game the king is a really valuable piece. Use it. Oh, yeah. And his king was watching from the sidelines for way too long. 
look at Magnus's king and the next few moves and look at a wonders king and it tells you the whole story. Mm. Yeah, sometimes you kind of, you know, forget about the classical rules of chess, the basic rules that we learn as beginners. And it's very important to remind them of oneself over and over again. So just bring the, ro bring the king when playing the end game. Yeah, and basically here, all of a sudden a position that was totally winning for white is now totally losing because these two connected passers are vicious. The king is in pole position to support them. Not that they need much supporting, frankly. And this bishop, you know, I've 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 traveled the world trying to evangelize the value of bishop overnight. And this is a really good example of a bishop attacking and defending at the same time. Knights can't do that. <laughs> so um basically a wonder had to resign and you know you could see live how disgusted he was with this basically turning the match it went from being eight and a half seven and a half cobras to eight and a half seven and a half chess bras so oof. i mean and that's that wasn't even the most adversarial thing that happened this week honestly so mm. yeah <laughs> it's a very good example you know this and by the way the previous position as well i don't know if you did that on purpose or not but it's very surprising to see how uh how good of an examples these are of exchange uh this balance you know the positions and a, a minor piece being stronger than the rook together with the pawns and it is very very educational as well you know uh like even me myself i know it's very often when you kind of uh underestimate the the strong the how strong a minor piece can be versus a rook and you know sometimes you do not have enough courage to sack exchange and it turns out to be a winning come like a, a perfect way to to outplay your opponent you and know something dina that was actually by that was not uh something intentional but i actually love sacking exchanges so maybe it was like uh it Your was just intuition. a sub subconscious, yeah, like a subconscious yeah. thing going on, Matt. Yeah. yeah what were you, Matt, you, what did you think about that one? Yeah, just from like a beginner, intermediate kind of perspective, both of these games being end game, being positions where, you know, personally, I need a lot of practice. The, like, like Dina said, these are very educational, very instructional uh, moments from from PCL, so you don't have to be like a international master or grandmaster to get a to get a lot out of watching PCL games and 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 doing some review of these games. Uh, it, yeah. Everyone can benefit for sure. All right, next matchup: Levitov Chess Wizards versus Garden State Passers. This was actually the first matchup in the Wednesday slate last week. Um, and Guys, before I just took we a... jump in into the next match, I uh, have a little emergency that I don't want to keep the details about my stream. So if you would leave me, if you would give me one sec to release the belt and be right back with you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Do your thing. Do your thing. We have uh, plenty of. I'll games. leave you with Fabi and my chess boxing belt. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> All right. So. Uh, this was the this is the matchup between the Garn State Passers and the Levitov Chess Wizards. The Chess Wizards did win, did indeed win this match. And this they won it 10 and a half, nine and a half. So it was another uh oh no, they didn't. They won it 10 to 6, excuse me. Um, so it was actually not quite a blowout, but teetering on one. And this was actually a position between uh Dennis Lavovic, Lazovic with black was on the chess wizards, and in this position, he it's really unclear whose king is actually safer. Um, I was actually watching this game live and I was like, well, who's better and why? And it's actually a tricky thing because both kings are kind of out there. Um, and I, I act, this is a, a position where it's white to move. And it's and really instructive because Lenderman is actually close to winning here, but the move to find that win is not particularly obvious. I'm going to save us all a bunch of time here and just point out that the best move in this position is not rook d2. Uh, which Alex Lenderman made, but it's actually, you ready for this? You ready for this? It's actually King G1. And the idea is that you hit this bishop and the rook is actually not hanging because there's actually knight f5 check. So bishop takes D1, knight f5 is just a killer. And it actually turns out that black's king is actually weaker than white's king. Unfortunately, Lenderman didn't find this and you know, the other problem with rook d2 is that these rooks, I hate split rooks. You know, when I see split rooks, I just shake my head like a like a stern teacher would. I just, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> so those rooks, you know, you want rooks connected, involved. 
they like to play together, you know, pawns, rooks, th these were pieces that, you know, they're kind of like, if you take this, if you're on a field trip, I always like to say pawns are like kids on a field trip. You have to hold hands in the public places or bad things are going to happen. I you love know? that. So, <laughs> wow. You, what a life advice. Yeah. This is, this is the reality. And so when you have see, bad things are going to happen to these rooks. And basically after a series of moves, these rooks that were connected took the open file. And all of a sudden this king on F2 became very, very airy. And after, and then look at this, another thing. Remember we talking about split rooks, split pawns? All of a sudden these pawns are split. These is not the type of geometry I like to see. So, um, you know, basically after some more dancing, it actually turned out white's king was much weaker. And, uh, you know, in a few moves, it, it became kind of clean up on aisle five again. And the king was there with no clothes. So split rooks, split pawns. We don't like that. We don't like that, right? No, we don't. Okay. All right, so that was the story of that match. The Wizards took it kind of convincingly and uh, you know, the passers have to go back to the drawing board. This next match is the most dramatic, I will say definitively. Um, it went to tie breaks. It was between the Norway Gnomes and the Spanish Maniac Shrimps. Matt, if you recall, we first covered the Shrimps a few weeks ago because they actually made out of qualifiers. Dina, this team, was fire in the qualifiers like does that rhyme fire in the qualifiers we'll count it <laughs> allow it okay. it's nice i like it um i'm available uh yeah. every week um <laughs> anyway um this position uh really decided the match it was it was basically eight eight and so they went into tie breaks and so that's as close as they can get right and then in tie breaks this game decided it, it was a heartbreaker so Gawain here actually is not losing. He's white. Um, Miguel Santos Ruiz from the uh, from the Maniac Shrimps is black. Gawain is actually not losing here, um, but he has to make sure he gets out of this pin here because D three is a really big threat. And so, uh, Dina, if you were going to get out this uh, this pin, what would you what would you do? Well, first of all, I do have to say that Rook endgames are one of the most complicated endgames. And there is another saying is that Rook endgames are always rubbish, but in fact, it's not that clear at all. And what is important for Rook endgames is obviously Rook activity, but also King activity. So when I look at this position at first, I see, I mean, obviously like white is an extra pawn, but this Rook on A2 for, for black, you know, already on the second rank and also such an active King on D5, I tend to say like, like if there is someone who will win this game is definitely black and then like i of course would prefer black here and then i would look for for how are the ways you know to to convert the advantage but well you asking me what i would do here as white i would definitely um try to see if there is a way to kick out the king now if we go with a check unfortunately the king only advances and we do not want that unless there is a certain thing you know afterwards we do have kind of like one temple right because the threat is d3 so what we would do on on the next move so um, honestly i don't have any any easy answer i would go with something like maybe okay rook b5 king e4 and now rook b4 attacking the the pawn hoping that uh no i don't know hoping that like if d d3 doesn't work so it would stop d3 right but if i continue rook b5 king e4 now rook b4 attacking the pawn there is c3 check the only move is king d1 then rook e1 then king e2 is that holding or not i don't know oh oh my gosh okay one last try Rook b5, king e4, rook b4, attacking the pawn, c3, king d1, rook a1. No, instead of rook a1, here is the move, king f3. Those and are a lot of, uh, those are a lot of yeah. arrows. And Let you're, me show you, you. I mean, you're, this is going over my head slightly, just slightly, slightly. I think it's just lost for, for, for white slows. So it's actually holding, um, not, I mean, this specific position I, I can't speak to, but this position is actually holding for white. And a lot of it actually comes down, the way I think about it is when I'm thinking about Rook end games, I'm always thinking about Philidor, Lucena, Philidor, Lucena. It's the drawing version is the is Philidor and the winning version is Lucena. And if you just take away this side of the board, if you just cut off this side of the board, right? You see that there's a two on one that ideally white would like to convert to a one on zero. Because if you're able to 
trade pawns when you're in these rook end games and then keep the rook kind of holding the line on the third or the sixth rank, you can draw those if you if with the Philidor approach. And um, for those that don't uh, aren't very familiar with the Philidor position, Google it, Wikipedia it. We don't have time to go over it in depth today, but trust me, it will come up again, and again, and again. And we maybe we will do that, Matt. Matt, we will we will actually do it at some point. We'll we'll get we'll grind the all twenty two, and we'll we'll look at the game film, and we'll just we'll we'll be we'll we'll dive in, you know. Right? But we can't swim today. So basically, the key thing here is actually to play King D one. And the idea is to actually just get out of D3, get out of the line of D3, because if white black does play D3, you can take and then ultimately get yourself to these Philidor-esque positions where the king can't cross the plane, where you give up these pawns on this side, but you ultimately hold the game. That's hard. Because it's hard, Gawain didn't see it, and he played F3. So now D3 happened. That's problem. Rook has to go passive. Passive rook sucks. Passive rooks are just passive rook, active rook. That usually tells you the story in rook endgames. And then this king can go to d4, car carrying this devastating threat of c3 check and then d2. And if you have a connected pass pawn that far down the board, Matt, you're just going to lose. Like there's no salvation for you. So um, that's kind of the, the reality. That's the boots on the ground here. But look at this turnaround. This is why this was the most shocking result. Dina, you're going to fall off your chair. So King D1 was played. C3. Uh-oh. Trouble in paradise. C takes D3. King takes D3. Now, because this opposition, we Matt, we, we spoke about opposition earlier today. Remember that? If this rook gets to the other side, that's checkmate. So the king stepped aside. Rook takes H2. Uh-oh. Rook H1 is a devastating threat that also wins the rook so Gawain is totally lost here totally lost he played rook takes c3 check king takes c3 black is up a rook <laughs> i repeat black is up a rook did not white didn't resign king f1 was played king d3 and now king g1 white's attacking this rook on h2 and then in this position Miguel Santos Ruiz, I, I'm, I'm sorry to, to put him, put his name out there like this, because again, it's we're, we're on the internet. If, this, if we weren't playing on the internet, things would be different, you know? But if I had all the money in the world, I might not, I might be on vacation right now. He played Rook F2. And he immediately was aghast. And all this would be aghast because King takes F2. And now it went from a winning position up a rook to a losing pawn ending, not even just a drawing, a losing pawn ending. And um, we've all been here online with mouse slips, but not many of us has been, had these type of mouse slips with this level of stakes. And so that's the kind of the horrifying thing. And it wasn't the only time there was these type of slip ups uh, this week. This, this happens when you play online. And so you know, it's another reason why sometimes people aren't resigning right away because it's, you kind of need to prove prove it a little bit more. But after King D4, King E2, it kind of set in and Black resigned. And um, man, uh, what what would oh you say? Gosh. What would you say uh, to someone if that, that if that happened to them? Well, I, I mean, it, on, on the one hand, it goes to show a never give up mentality and what can happen. Yeah, miracles happen. <laughs> Mouse slips happen. They're, they're you know. It, I know it's like chess etiquette to resign in certain situations. Uh, and, and I'm just going to claim novice here, but I, I feel like I should play through every game. Cause I, I, you know, maybe someone will make a mistake or maybe I'll learn a little bit more about how to draw something out or how to try to work to, towards a draw or, or something. So I love that he didn't give up and I love that it, it, it paid off for him. Um, and then on the other hand, you know, I, on my, on Miguel's side, you know, it, it happens, shake it off. Don't, don't get hung up on it. Don't let it eat away at you. Keep you up at night. Okay. You know, it's one game in a long season. It's only week one mental toughness. Uh, you know, uh, be your own best friend, be in your own corner and, and get back up and keep going. 
it's, yeah. it's very heartbreaking i have to say you guys i <laughs> i don't know it's it's just it's 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 too much yeah it's like wh what was the like the idea what was the he wanted to play rookie too right i guess yeah um i don't know this is like this is very painful i'm like you know like i'm the, the devil advocate here <laughs> yeah i don't you know, know what's crazy it's you know what's hard, crazy yeah. is that honestly you're probably right i wasn't actually thinking about that what was the move he intended it probably was rookie two mm -hmm. in my opinion that would actually still be incorrect from a practical perspective, I want to bring my rook as far away from the king as possible so that I don't have to think about it again. And so yeah. to me, that was actually imprecise decision making. Um, and I think I'll learn from it. At the end of the day, there are so many more weeks. You just hope that, you know, in the standings, you know, look for three, four weeks from now. And if this is the game that determines whether they qualify to the knockouts or not you know, that would really be something, but, um, you know, there is a lot of money on the line in, in the, this event. So, um, it's a shame, but it happens. And like, like our man, Miguel Santos, um, we're going to move on. <laughs> so definitely life goes on, life goes on. All right. So we got a few more matchups. I'm going to get through those a bit quicker so we can get in our guest who's been eagerly waiting for us in the green room. So I'm going to, I'm going to wait, I'm gonna speed it up a little bit here. Okay. So the next matchup, uh, what you're going to actually um, go through is the uh, team MGD1 versus the Blitz. Um, MGD1, it's funny. It's a, there's a lot of, I don't know what MGD1 stands for. I, it might be a sponsor or something. I don't know. I need to do some research there. There are a lot of uh, Indian players on the, on that team though. So um, yeah, this game actually is, uh, is uh, going to be taken between uh Mit Rabha Guha and Boyer Mahel or Mahel Boyer. Mahel Boyer is actually an international master that I think might have just gotten his GM GM title, but it's not confirmed yet. Mm. Um, and uh, he Mahel was a part of the Blitz. The Blitz actually won this match in a very very tight fashion. They won ten and a half, nine and a half. So Ooh. this also went to tie breaks, um, tie breaks galore. And you know it's funny because it was white to move here, and you know. If I'm white and looking at this position, you know, I always tell, you know, you, you got to, as soon as it becomes available, Matt, you know what you do as soon as it's available? You want to guess? As soon as it becomes available, what move do you do? Castle? Yes. 10 points for Griffin. Woo, exactly all right. All right. right. I'm two Yay. for two here. Okay. <laughs> and basically, basically, Midra Aguha forgot that principle. Hmm. He played D3. That's not castling as soon as possible. And Boyer punished this immediately with knight takes f2. Mm. And uh, basically the queen and the knight get to just converge on the e3 square. And after king takes f2, knight g4 check. Oof. Knight takes e3. Oof. That's, this, is a, this is a family family fork. Knight takes g2 check. Yikes. King f1. Then the bishop comes into play. Uh, and you know what? When, you know, we talked about those bishops before. The bishops come into play. Um, and then they're here to stay. Cut them up. G1, Bishop F4. And the only reason I'm even showing the rest of this game is because there's a, a photo finish I wanted to show that was actually not played, but I had to show it because I was like, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Ooh, it brutal. just, it just, and again, there's not, there has not been resignation yet. And so you could be really annoyed because someone isn't resigning. But really, it's because things can happen in a in a rapid game that will, might not happen over the board. Short time, and it's you're playing with the mouse and so on. So there's a little bit more pers persistence. But ultimately, Black did resign uh, and threw in the towel here, and that was it. So uh, the Blitz move on, um, very triumphant, um, and yeah, good for the Blitz. I love the way you call it the photo finish. You know, it's funny because I actually kind of misspoke. This was not the beautiful finish I was alluding to. I mixed up my game, so I didn't mean to say that, but I appreciate it nonetheless. But it is nice. I mean, there is a lot of fire here, so it depends what you call a photo finish. Mm. Fair. I consider, you know, Flash we can define, it. I consider photo finish something that's super aesthetic and like competitive. This is like a blowout. I'm looking at a blowout here. If I count the material, there, 
look at these rooks. Where where are White's rooks? <laughs> so exactly. Uh, you know, everything is like um completely destroyed as if it was uh something something very dangerous and very uh you know explosive happened here. And uh, it kind of there is has reference, you know, when you have those wild sports with a lot of speed. Here there has been a lot of speed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, next game. We got two more games and then our guest. So uh the next matchup that I really want to highlight was between the St. Louis Archbishops and the Shanghai Tigers. The reason this was actually an upset to me because on the first two boards were uh, Dominguez. And I think, well, I think Dominguez was playing. Maybe Caruana wasn't in this last round, but Dominguez was playing and the Shanghai Sharks field a very strong team of Chinese players. But I was really surprised at the way uh, Wei Yi here as, as part of the Shanghai Ch Tigers team really outplayed Dominguez. And, you know, when you're playing chess, you love to create threats, but it's really where you, rare you create threats to move after move after move over and over again. Check this out because this is truly beautiful. Like this is a photo finish or Dina, this is a photo finish. Okay. Uh -huh. So check this out. Black to move. Bishop E8. This carries a threat. The threat is knight takes E4, taking advantage of the rook lining up against the queen. So that's threat number one. Queen has to get out the way, get out of that pin. B5, threat number two, attacking the bishop. You got to deal with that. Bishop moves. Threat number three, queen D7, attacking the knight. That's pretty good. Rook defense. Threat number four, attacking the C3 pawn, the E2 queen, and something more subtle, this bishop on G3, because there's this, this bishop on A7 lurking in the wind. So that's actually a pin. So that's four threats in a row. We don't normally see that in our own game. That's hard to, to conjure up. All right, king goes to F1. Threat, all right, all right, maybe it's not a threat, but capture number five, threat number five. The queen comes to C, it comes to C3. Maybe the some other piece gets in the act. Black, white had the nerve to play A3 here. That is, is, that's less tepid as a tepid bath when you have a fever. That is not, <laughs> that's not what you're supposed to be doing. So, Rook came in, threat number six, uh, rook to d3, oh, lining up. This is this is the equivalent of you getting your sneakers or your shoe, your finest shoes, and stepping all over their couch, their white couch with your outdoor shoes on. That's, that's disrespectful, but that's what's happening here. This rook is way too comfortable. Bishop moves, and this is why I showed this game, Matt, Dina. This is why I showed this game. Rook oh, h3. Mm. Oh my boy. Oh my goodness. What a move. What Wait a, a second move. here. Wait a second here. So why why isn't the pawn just taking the rook? Good question because um <laughs> Dominguez played bishop g1, which is the sorriest bishop I've seen oh. uh this decade. Um <laughs> but Very after g cool. takes h3, this queen swoops over Ooh. to h3 with check. Uh oh. And the bishop is lost because of the pin here. So if the king goes to g1, Dina, you want to do the honors and tell us what uh, Black does here? All right. So something tells me that the key piece in this game has forever been white bishop on h2. So how about we ask him how he feels by the move g3? Yikes. Yikes. Uh, and again, it looks like it can be captured in two ways, but the f2 pawn can't move because the bishop is pinning. And the bishop on h2... It's just going to be gobbled up after bishop takes g3, queen takes g3, check. And it's still trouble in paradise. So Yeah, um, because of the pin once again, the bishop on h, the a7, you can see pawn cannot take. Exactly, exactly. Just a total nightmare or bishop mare. Um, <laughs> <laughs> again, these bishops. So, uh, yeah, so unfortunately, Dominguez, and again, Dominguez is a strong grandmaster. Do you see this 2743 rating up there? They don't They don't just give those out. So uh, after rook h3, bishop g1 was played, and then rook h1. Oh, my gosh. This rook went on quite the journey. It started on a8, then it castled long, then it came here, then came here. That's really beautiful geometry. Now, that is a photo finish. And after knight e3, black played knight d4, and then Dominguez was like, I'm done. I'm done. I can't look at this anymore. Ah, Queen has nowhere to go. It's so it's, disgusting, to be honest. It's, it's just like, you know, you, you you do not just kill, yeah? You really torture. Mm. Step by step, you cut finger <laughs> by finger, you know, until you get to the to the head. 
That's terrifying. It's, <laughs> it's truly, I mean, it's just disgusting. It's yeah. and again, you don't see strong players lose this way. And so it's actually kind of cool when they do because it demonstrates in some ways that they're human, but that also um, you know, the chess principles matter, you know, like the development matters, the king safety matters, all these things matter. And when someone plays in a kind of nonchalant way, they can be punished. So it's 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 good to see too. It's I'm sorry Dominguez had to experience this, but I'm glad we got to see it. You know, for our so, benefit, right? Brilliant or blunder. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we, Whatever it takes for the crowd, you know, for the beauty of chess. There you go. There you go. All right. California Bears versus the Croatia Bulldogs. This is the biggest heartbreaker of the of the event, I think. This this was also a very tight match. The California uh Am I saying their name right? The California Unicorns, not the Bears. Who <laughs> uh, they won nine to seven. And okay. they won in law. This match would have gone to tie break if not for this game. Bogdan Daniel Dick is a very strong grandmaster. I might be pronouncing his name wrong, but he's 2,700. Very talented young player. And he's totally outplayed Darius Schwartz here. And look what happens in a few moves. B3. That looks like a pawn that's about to queen. B take A takes A three A three brilliant A two A one mm. getting down the yellow brick road about to make, become a queen ninety one trying to come back and defend that square A two knight C two knight B four trying to dislodge this knight from the queening square and also uncovering an attack on the bishop knight takes B four was played. And guess what was not played by Black here? Did he not queen? He did not queen. What? This uh, man yeah. did not queen. Oh, and you could see it. If, I don't know if it was a pre-move because yeah. you could see it on screen. If you look on YouTube, he like violently is like, like, it's just like, it's like waking up from a nightmare or something. Oh, no. Because he played Bishop takes E4. Oh, my God. And <sighs> just an equal trade. Can, <laughs> yeah, the only thing I can think is maybe he thought the knight wasn't attacking the A2 pawn. Um, I didn't have the heart to ask or invite him on the show. I and mean, that's not very nice. You shouldn't have. You uh, shouldn't have. Of course not. Of course it's not. already painful enough to see this, you know. Man, honestly, if you just looked in the archives of my games, oof, there are some games that if I won this game, I would have in a GM like the, the things happen in life and you know this is just one of those things mm. because basically the crazy thing is again just like the last game now after night takes a two it's not just that black isn't winning anymore they're actually losing now they're in a situation two pawns down um and uh just like that um you know black fought for a little while longer because you know you know bishops are typically better than knights you know their pawns and we've said that a few times today their pawns on both sides of the board so the bishop can attack and defend at the same time but two pawns down is just it's just not salvageable and ultimately here when the knight got to a square where it could usher the support the push of the pawn um black resigned mm. and so this result basically led to the California Unicorns beating the Croatia Bulldogs, even though they really were in pole position to um, to have it be the other way. So you could see how these games just change. Um, these matches change based on a few games. Uh, it's And again, you don't see blunders like this from strong players very often. It's partially the internet format. Not partially, almost largely the internet format, right? So... Um, yeah. So yeah. Real quick, Casa, you're getting a lot of love in chat for your storytelling and the Charlotte Chess Center. Just gave you a little ch a shout out saying hello. You have some oh, shout out. I, lo I love those folks down there. We got, got to love. I, I went to Duke University, so I was in North Carolina and, um, you know, Peter Giannatos, the team down there, Grant, Dominique, I'll shout all those folks out. They <laughs> do a really great job of making chess relevant in the U S and uh, I hope to be back there soon. So, um, uh, yeah. You so, definitely should. Yeah. Adina, you were actually in Charlotte not too long ago, right? Yeah, that's correct. I did play in the open tournaments in back in January and, uh, well, it was a huge success. Uh, although the, uh, the chess part wasn't that much of a success, but <laughs> yeah, I did, I did impress the club for sure. I am, I'm pretty confident they want me back. Oh, wow. Okay. 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 
you know, there's the, you know, wherever you go these days in America, you know, you have to contend with juniors that are not, not what they say they are, what they're rated. They're not, the number on that chart is not their strength. You just got to know that going in, you got to mentally just add a couple hundred points and, and that's kind of your baseline. So um, yeah, American juniors, Indian juniors, some other juniors, juniors, international, they, there needs to be some type of correction to the rating system, but alas, it's not going to happen anytime soon. The so. future is bright. Are young kids yeah. being being great at chess? It's exciting. It's like what you're saying earlier with Magnus and uh, and being you know have, being a little bit more of a veteran with all this young talent coming in. It's exciting for our sport. I think that's that's to be celebrated. Oh, you're so. I mean, I, I can I, say I, for myself that I definitely learned my lessons, and I'm not playing those those kids, those American kids anymore. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's an adjustment period. You actually will acclimate to them. It's like going to a place where you need to adjust to the food or the weather or something. You you do adjust. It just so I wouldn't say don't come back ever because you will get used to playing those kids, and then it'll actually make you a better chess player. So, um, good mindset. Okay. Now to the match we've all been waiting for. Ooh. So uh, the Berlin Bears had a really tough match against the Gotham Knights this week. And um, they ultimately lost a very, very tight match. And by tight match, I think I'm going to, I'm going to verify this. I'm going to look at my notes really quickly. They lost nine to seven. The Berlin Bears did, but there were uh, some very, very special games. And without further ado, Matt, can you introduce our guest, please? Absolutely. So uh, if you haven't already heard of our guest this week, uh, you, you certainly will learn about her today. Uh, we have a, a very talented women's grandmaster with us who uh, reps the Berlin Bears. And in the first game of the series, uh, board one plays board four in each matchup. And it kind of builds up so that the, the equivalent seats play each other for the final round. So, uh, you know, it builds up to hype. So I, a lot of people consider these early games as just kind of givens. You know, the, the one's going to beat the four and et cetera, et cetera. But we got such a treat this uh, this week from our guest, Women's Grandmaster Josephine Heinemann. So uh, I'd love to bring her on right now. Uh, Josephine, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Hi. Welcome to the so, show. So glad you're here. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I've so, been watching you. You showed some interesting stuff. Apologize in advance um, because we did keep you waiting longer than I anticipated. And I know it's late where you are. You're you're coming coming in uh, to us hot from Germany. So at six hours ahead, right? So it's like 11 o'clock where you are. But we just had to have you on. You played some really good chess this week. And people don't realize, like, you're the board four on your team. And, you know, you're an underdog in most of the games you're going to play, right? And, uh, and to really not just to really outperform for your position is just a really big deal because it gives your chance, your team a chance to actually win the match. And so you didn't just, you know, have a, uh, have this one upset. You actually fought hard enough to give your team a chance to win. And I think that really should be recognized. But of course, we're going to start with the game, the first game you played against Hikaru Nakamura that caught everyone's attention. And um, I actually took us to this moment here in the middle game, but actually maybe you want to give us a few words about the the opening and what happened earlier, because I know you probably, when you play someone of this caliber, there's a lot that goes into it. And so um, I can actually make the moves or if, if you want, you can make the moves and uh, just sort of give us a sense of what you were thinking. Um, would you uh, yeah, to sure. Or you want to do it? I will make the moves and, sure. and say what I was thinking. So, okay, first of all, I prepared actually only for board three and board four of the Gotham Knights because I didn't rate my chances against uh, Le and uh, Hikaru too too high. And I thought it's important to, to make some points against these, the other two players. And yeah, okay, on the other hand, it's also not so much fun to prepare against players like Hikaru because he plays everything. <laughs> And yeah, I have never seen the position after the second move already. He played d6 and f5. Uh, I don't know what this is. Uh, Hikaru revealed in his YouTube recap that he prepared a YouTube video on this, but it was not published yet. So yeah, some prep here, but uh, okay, I decided... 
to well, take. Just, can I just interrupt you for a little second? Because I'm curious, Dina, Matt, have you ever seen D6 F5? Because I've never seen it. Um, I've seen it in 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 openings against D4 and C4, like some Dutch hybrid, but this has to be more suspect, right? Yeah, my statesman uh, GM Ben Feingold is losing his mind right now, <laughs> o- opening with the F pawn. There's no way that uh, any any coach I've interacted with, anyone that that I know, would recommend to to move the F pawn on the second move of the game. So, question for you, Josephine, because you obviously know this is different. This is weird. Did you take this? How did you take this once you saw the move on the board? Were you like, oh, like he's going to play something weird and I'm going to have to like, and I want to punish this. You were like, let me just relax, do what I was going to do anyway. Like, what was your mindset when you saw this? Actually, I was uh, scared that it's going to end up very embarrassing uh, because if I get a bad position out of this opening, I like, imagine, yeah, and <laughs> it's like this happened. So. It's just like Bone Cloud, you know, when they play you Bone Cloud and you kind of, if you don't win, it is like the most embarrassing thing that can happen <laughs> against you. I, I even like read one interview of Anish Giri saying that he actually studied it with Anjan, you know, to, you know to, to get ready for the next time. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's exactly like that. So, yeah. I mean, okay, this line is bad, but it's not losing, I believe. I didn't check it so deeply after the game, but uh, I think right. Black survives. So, okay, F5 weakened the white square, so I decided to play Bishop D3. Mm-hmm. Okay, Karo played Queen D7. Apparently, this is still some kind of theory. Uh, okay, I developed and Knight F6. Okay, he doesn't want to allow D5 with a tempo, so he starts with Knight F6 instead of Knight C6. Here, I don't know, somehow I didn't want to allow bishop g4, so I decided just to trade the bishop, and I castled. And here after knight c6, somehow I started to get really scared of him, which was yeah quite stupid, actually. Uh, okay, the yeah, right idea here. Yeah, no, if you get scared of these players, you have no chance anymore, yeah, normally. So, so yeah. What, so if you, what were you, uh, if you had to do it, over again you're saying that here you got scared you played c3 what would you play now with uh if you could play it again okay 100 person c4 the right idea is definitely to put the pawn on d5 to use this weak square on e6 yeah and somehow i was scared that the knight will get to c2 but there's just not a single line where this ever happens because i always have this queen a4 check Mm. (laughs) it just doesn't work and that weak e6 square that you're mentioning, it's very reminiscent of positions in the King's Indian where black pushes the f pawn and then the e6 square is weak. There's a lot of uh, positions where there's like knight g5, knight e6. So uh, you could definitely see some some positions where you get that pawn to d5 and then knight installs on e6 and then you have that octopus knight. Yeah, and here even the e files open, yeah? So, yeah, um, I think... Then white position is very good. But I played c3, and after e5, I made the next mistake. Um, my first idea here was to go queen b3. Uh, but I thought black will castle and d5. And after knight e7, c4, like during the game, I thought uh, it's not so clear. Black will try to attack me on the king side. But actually, it's not so clear where is black's attack. And white is just better, I think. <laughs> so. Yeah, you're just so much faster, right, here on the queen side. Yeah. Again, this was a very strange decision. Isn't h6 yeah. almost looks like a only move now, right? Because knight g5, knight e6 is also coming in some positions. Yeah, but if you play h6, even if you manage g5, g4, yeah, there's like I didn't play h3, so how are you going to mate me? Exactly, exactly. Mm. Yeah, so again, very strange decision, and I'm sure by now Hikaru was already happy. <laughs> By the way, Matt, I, just to point out, because I, I don't want to, I don't want to keep our man here, our in, in the dark a little bit, is when uh, I'm, I'm going to be the the uh, the the WGM translator here. So please, please. Jo- Josephine was saying that, you know, with H6 and G5 in the previous position back here, if I could just go back here for a hot second, that even if these pawns start to march, because she hasn't touched her kingside pawns, there's no lever to any open up any files, mm. and so. If Justin played h3 or, or something like that, then there would be what I like to call a hook to open up the, the file once the pawn makes contact with the kingside pawns. But if you don't touch your pawns, then it's much harder to actually open up a file. And so that's what she was pointing out in a way that, you know, for for the 
for the uh for the initiated is like, oh yeah, of course. But you know, it's it's useful for our audience as well to uh, to understand that. Super Sorry. useful. Thanks for going into detail on that. Yeah, it's, it's like a solid wall without any chinks in it. Uh, if you if you exactly. don't exactly the- exactly yeah. exactly. Sorry you about know, that. When they say don't move the pawns in front of your king, there is a reason for that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So okay, opened up the position, but now black's pieces kind of get active, especially the bad bishop on f8. And okay, now I decided to go h3 because I got scared of some knight g4 ideas. It's probably not such a bad move, but also not a good one in long castle. Okay, already e4 and bishop h2 is a threat because of my queen. So I played queen e2. Yeah, e4, knight h2 and knight e5. And suddenly, I don't know, black has a big development advantage and all my pieces are passive. And yeah, it's <laughs> very, very bad position. Um, okay, I decided just to develop what what to do. Knight d3. I was not ready to give up material yet. H5, and here I played knight a3. Um, I was kind of hoping that he will take on a3 so that I will get the b file and I don't know, maybe some tricks. Probably it's just absolutely nothing, but Tikoro saw the same like me. Why to help me to, to open up the b file? <laughs> uh, so yeah, he played g5. Knight c4, now I want to exchange the bishop. At least, so it will not mate me. Yeah, Matt. When, and, you're getting, when you're getting pressed like this, when you're when there's a lot of pieces coming towards you, you want to trade pieces to alleviate the pressure on your position. So simplify. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. So I took on h2 g4, and here h4. If I open up the h file, it's just mate in a few moves. Mm-hmm. And knight d5, and I decided to go back to g1 because I was a bit scared that g3 will happen with check. And also I just felt that after g3, I would like to have the idea of f3. Um, yeah, he played a6. I have no real idea, so I decided to double the rooks. Maybe at some point I will be ready to give up the exchange on d3 because this knight is just so strong. Yeah, rook g8, uh, rook d1, and I think this was the position that you wanted to show, yeah? Or... Yeah, so for the record, like in, in a few moves, we get to a juncture where every move for the rest of the game that Josefina plays is basically the best move in the position. And I, I wanted to actually get to that moment because, you know, she's been under pressure. You, It's, it's very fair to say that Nakamura played something very unorthodox, it worked to some extent. And then Josephine was forced to defend for an extended period of time. And it's really something that shouldn't be taken for granted because most people just crack. You know, when the, the screws get turned on, they crack. They they just they just collapse. And that didn't happen here. So a lot of what Josephine is saying about, well, you know, I, it was a tough decision to make and I wasn't sure here. And she got all of the that's hanging around right. She got that right where a lot of people get that wrong. And it's just, you know, we just need to give you your flowers for doing that because we see all the time that not happening. And so for you to hang in there and then actually turn the tables, well, we'll, we're going to get to see what that looked like. Amen. Yeah, so he played G3 here and after F3, I already had the feeling that okay at least it's not so simple for black anymore because at some point i can always threaten to take e4 and then the d3 knight will be loose and yeah here something very strange happened because i was sure that the idea of queen f6 and queen takes h4 to mate me just doesn't work and he kind of thought for okay quite a while like one minute but he didn't spend much time on the game so it was like a really long time and he played queen f6 and i was just shocked because i was sure it doesn't work but yeah you kind of trust guys like hikaru probably saw something that i didn't see yeah but okay i have just one move to defend the h4 pawn and okay his idea was to take and take with the queen and still black's idea is to play queen h4 so i have to take e4 with the queen and now he's kind of unlucky that like he's probably losing even more material because of the strong pin on the d file and he played knight f4. Again, the idea is to play queen h4, queen h2. But here I have knight e3, which is attacking the knight, but even more importantly, going back to f1 to defend the h2 square. And suddenly black just has no threats at all. Um, 
And here I think it's just over because also I have the threat of c4. And yeah, Hikaru also didn't find any idea. He played queen h4, but knight f1. I'm threatening rook d5 now, so he decided to defend the, the knight. But after c4, the knight is hanging anyways. And I will be even a rook up. This is a bit too much even for Hikaru, it seems. <laughs> Especially well, in this position. We call this a cold shower in the, in the in show business. <laughs> <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> yeah. And okay, the rest of the game was not so difficult. He played rook d7. Okay, he's trying to have some ideas for if rook e7, knight e2, or rook e2, maybe. But I just took the knight, and after rook e7, I gave check. King b8, and I took on c6. I'm not scared of knight e2 because I can just capture it. But yeah, what else to do for black? And I took, took, and queen f8. After king a7, I will have queen c5. This should be made very soon. So he played king c7, but after queen queen d6, king b6, c7, I'm going to promote my pawn. And after king a7, c8, queen, Ooh. I think he was talking a bit on stream and took some time to resign, but yeah, finally he did. Wow. I, I saw your face on camera right after it happened. <laughs> uh, walk us through that because... and. I, I, we can actually watch uh, the clip together if if we want to. It's less than a minute. Uh, we can see the oh, end of the game play live. It? Yeah, yeah, we have want to. to. Okay. All right, let's let's take a look. Cool. So, um, so we'll pull it up. Uh, I I love this down. reaction there so there much. That's so we'll smile. we'll just bring Evenly it back. That, let's get some Gotham right, Knights merchant yeah, too. Good go. luck to the team the rest of the way. Maybe maybe All this right. is the drama that the people wanted. Hikaru, as you said, he's a streamer first, content first, and we are gonna have drama now with this with this board one upset so good luck man and we'll uh we'll talk to you later yep thanks guys cheers yeah see, see you soon levy wow danny i mean i can't believe I'm, it i'm shocked it was it's so funny because like that that script was supposed to go very differently we were supposed to have international master levy rosman like talk about recruiting Hikaru, thinking, celebrate Hikaru's first victory here and instead the gloves came absolutely off. The wheels came off. Wow. Oh, okay. And look at her. She is jubilant here. She was trying not <laughs> to celebrate. the sip of tea. The sip of tea. The celebratory. We did it. Uh, so, I, can't, I can't say enough about... When I saw that reaction, I felt what you were feeling. Like, I felt this, this transfer of energy of, like... That kind of moment, that kind of of upset is uh, is so exhilarating. So can you just talk a little bit about like how you're feeling in that moment? What what was going through your mind? Uh, what it means to you? Yeah, I mean, it was very difficult belie to believe. Like, I don't know. I just didn't see the scenario happen. We're actually, it was funny. We were in training camp until a few days before this with the German national team and all the guys from my team were there. And we were at lunch and I said for fun, okay, don't worry, I will take care of Hikaru. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did. It actually happened. <laughs> so, yeah, and okay, I didn't want to celebrate too much because first of all, it was the first match and also the other guys like might have still been playing because I was just focusing on my game. I didn't know if they were still playing, so I needed to be quiet and also yeah, just didn't want to disturb them. But yeah, I was incredibly happy because, yeah, you don't beat such players a lot, especially from such positions. <laughs> and yeah, even for a long time this evening, I was really, really happy and just I couldn't even fall asleep. So um, yeah, it was an amazing feeling. There must be someone like the highest rating that you ever beaten, right? Yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, there aren't many higher, Dean. I don't know. Yeah, if you yeah, know. I was about to say. Like, <laughs> it's a short list. Yeah, like... that, that's exactly what I thought when I was asking the question. But yeah, wow. And you know, also, like, I'm sure, Josephine, it's it's kind of like special, you know, like, well, like, I don't know, like, what about you? But for me, when, when a player plays, like, the such moves as F5, move number two, I kind of, like, immediately think you are, like, okay, very funny. You're trolling me. You're disrespecting me. Well, you're going to pay for that. And when it actually happens and you give the man the lesson, you know, I am sure it feels even better. Yeah, that's true. It's yeah, you feel kind of disrespected when you see such an opening. But when you see Hikaru, you kind of feel he probably can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Absolutely. I, I totally uh, empathize with that, too, because um, that that feeling of disrespect, I think we've all felt it on some level at some point where someone plays something that, like, you just feel like you need to punish. And um, 
and you don't always get to punish it, honestly, right? Like, so, um, but I just, again, want to just reinforce the notion that once you got your chance, you played all the best moves. There was no coming back for uh, Hakar there. And there are a lot of situations where people don't, you know, take advantage of their chance the way you did. So I just, on behalf of, you know, everyone watching, bravo. <laughs> Seriously, I, it was really, really cool to see. And there's a lot of support for you in chat. And, and in fact, one, uh, one, one member, I think, of your community, Bowties Live, which I love the name, uh, shouted out your Twitch channel, which you just started. So if people want to go over, support Josie on Twitch, it's in the chat. You might have to scroll up a little bit now, but, um, but and, and it's in German. Otherwise, I tried to say it, but <laughs> uh, go support Josie over there. So I yeah, actually am also streaming in German. So <laughs> there we go. <laughs> hey, ch the, ch the chess moves are, uh, that's the silent communication. So even that, that language we can understand. So, um, you know, but I also pulled in the two draws you had uh, in the match as well. Um, uh, your, your game against Andy Woodward and your game against Natalia Buxa. If there was anything, uh, I, I pulled out a few moments there that I found were pretty cool. Um, uh, but, you know, if, if you have any uh, thoughts of your own on the game, I would just point out in this game against Andy Woodward, you traded queens, you have a, a bit of a, uh, there's like a hedgehog structure going on. And I thought it was really, really classy here um, as white that you played F4 and then King F3. And it's just like a really nice way to take space, centralize the king a bit. Um, it's an end game. It's like, well, it's a queenless middle game. And it's really cool to see that, you know, you had that recognition. Well, I can actually centralize my king can be an asset uh, because we talked earlier in these other some of these other games like, you know, hey, the king can be a piece at some point that's pretty useful. And you kind of recognize that early. Um, the game ended in a draw, a much longer draw. But I thought um, that was a pretty cool moment. Um, did, was there anything you you what, what were your thoughts behind this game or uh, was there any tense moments? Yeah, actually, later on, there was one tense moment. I can put this on the board here. Until here, it was quite easy to play for me. But now somehow I was lacking a plan. And yeah, I think I played some inaccurate moves. And yeah, let me just put the position on the board where it was interesting. Yeah, and he played knight c5. And here I found the right defensive idea, but I didn't find the right move order. Mm. And... Yeah, luckily he didn't use it, but it's a very interesting example uh, to look for opponent's resources as well. So, yeah, I think I'm just going to walk you through this. Black's idea is rook d3 check. And then, yeah, Black might take on g3, and this would be not so great. So White somehow needs to activate the rook from b1. And for this, we should open up the b file. And that's why I played b4 here. And it worked out very well because Andy played rook d3 check. And then, okay, this I will show later. But actually, black has the move rook b6 here. And here, probably white has quite a bad position because a4 is also hanging with check. And yeah, here, I don't know. I think I would not defend this probably. <laughs> but yeah. Um, and that's why actually white should start with king c2 here. Because now, okay, rook b6 makes no sense because the pawn is still on b3. And after rook d3, white can play b4 and we will get exactly the position from the game. And yeah, I played b4, he took, and now with uh, the active white rook, black doesn't have enough even after taking the pawn because the knight is a bit unstable on c5. And yeah, actually we repeated the position uh, directly with knight e5, knight f7 check, and yeah, until the threefold. Repetition. But yeah, this was a very interesting moment. Apart from that, the game was quite balanced. I mean, I was slightly better, but then he yeah, more or less comfortably equalized and nothing much happened there. Yeah. Again, a very a very legitimate hold, especially in a, in a match that was very tight. So, um, uh, I mean, the, again, the defensive skills were on display because this was not... The, the last position you showed before uh, the B4 opportunity was was one where black is pressing, right? So um, again, a lot of people go down there and you're like, nah, not today. <laughs> so um, yeah, total That's respect. That's what it that. is, the fighting spirit, you know? It's always there with you. Yeah, Amen. for sure. And then I actually also pulled up the game against, um, uh, you played against uh, Natalia Buxa because again, 
there's I thought this was really talented defending because we see a, a we see a rook end game where it's a three on two. And we know that's a draw theoretically, but you know, you have to get there. And I, I mean, we've saw even more dramatic blunders in some of the earlier games today. Yeah, we did. Um, showing the technique behind you, how you hold one of these things is really important. Um, and I thought it was really classy that after white played King G3 here, you played H5. So you said, you know what, I'm going to go from, my pawns are split. I'm happy to also trade a pawn and to go from a three versus two to a two versus one is fine because if I get two versus one to one versus zero, I get to my Philidor land, you know, and, you know, again, Matt, you're going to have to Google that later. Yeah. But, um, but uh, actually there's, there's probably, we get, you gotta, we actually go on chess.com and actually find the Philidor position. We can, you can, tr- you can practice on the site. Actually. Why am I, I'm telling you going somewhere off the site to learn this anyway. So after, after King H4, H6, G4, H6, G4, black can't really be active, but what has to wait for white to improve enough to then, uh, get to the point where white's king is exposed and then come from behind and josephine is like yeah duh but uh for people that are watching this isn't that obvious um i've i've we've all been here dina you you've been in one of these before right many times right oh yeah yeah it's funny i i once even won uh like rook end game four pawns i had four pawns versus three and yeah you know when you have four pawns versus three then it gets to three to two and then two to one and but yeah, it's, I mean, Rook Hand Games, as I said, well, good job, Castle, for, you know, for bringing very, the best examples from, from the last week on the Rook Hand Games. They're always complicated. You always see that they're drawish, but it's not that easy. Yeah, one of the, the secret sauce typically is the more, the more pawns that the side that's a pawn up has, the better the winning chances. So five versus four is better than four versus three is better than three versus two etc cetera, etc cetera. so the defending side is comfortable trading as long as their king is kind of near in pole position to defend the queening square and prevent white's king from getting there because if white king gets there then we're in uh lucena land so um so yeah so basically i mean really nice technique waiting 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 and then as soon as white tries to really shove and again i'm going through this relatively quickly because this yeah as soon as white shoves it's like ah now you've given me you got me the i get to sneak through the back door through the through the back entrance and then the mercilessly you know harass the the white king from behind and honestly natalia books was like you know what i'm good like this is this is not i'm not making progress this is uh this isn't fun at all and then eventually the game wound up being a draw so another really really great example of like good defense like is defense a part of your game typically or was it just the situations you were in this week uh, or last week josephine well okay about this rook end game actually funny story and in, in december i lost one rook end game three against four against daniel dada also on one wing <laughs> So this was really embarrassing. He just tortured me for 100 moves and <laughs> on move 103 or something, I made a stupid tactical blunder. Well, it was already one against one. So, so you learn your lessons. Yeah, and okay, I spent a lot of time on how to defend it. Yeah. yeah. And Natalia didn't find this, yeah, more testing idea that Daniel tried on me. But even this, I would know how to defend now. So and I also heard you guys studied this in training camps with the German national women's team. Yeah, but we with usually you coach. We studied work end games. I don't think so. Ah, yeah, actually, I asked him to do Before that. The Olympics. I Dina, heard it sounds like you have some insider information here. Well, I'll definitely you. have some jealousy from how you guys managed to build up your women's national female team and how the situation improved from, you know, several years ago and what it is now. And it is kind of personal to me because I do have like kind of same struggle right now with my national Israeli team, you know, fighting for the right coach, fighting for the training camps. But yeah. Training camps, setting rook end games, Josephine. I am very jealous. Yeah, actually, my private coach is Arthur Yusupov, and we studied rook end games for one year now. <laughs> wow! It's Damn like we girl. did nothing else. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't know. In general, I'm I think not so bad at uh, defending slightly worse positions. But rapid is actually not my specialty. I don't know what happened last week. <laughs> Uh, usually I'm quite bad at rapid, so yeah. 
Matt, by the way, do you know the most popular type of end game? Rook, Rook end games. Huh? Rook end games. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely something that's worth studying um, in great detail. And cause it's just happens so often. And a lot of times when you're playing in middle games, just visualizing the prospects of a rook end game later is super useful to understand like how's where's my rook's positioning, my king's positioning, my pawn structure. So um yeah, uh I'm not surprised uh that uh you're studying them in, in depth, but um I mean your performance, you know, was really incredible. And um yeah, I mean again, just I mean, I just I can't I just I, I gotta clap. I gotta give you your snap. So um <laughs> yeah. really um Really amazing. Now, one more thing, I guess we should say, you know, we 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 dog Nakamura slightly, you know, bringing up this his his adversarial situation, but they the the uh, the Gotham Knights did wind up winning the match. So I thought it'd be only fair to show uh, a game that basically they clinched. And um, Josephine, you might want to like you might want to turn away because this one isn't pretty but uh <laughs> and, but, and while um, you pull that one up casa so if you want to learn uh rook pawn end games and anything else chess we are giving away chess.com memberships uh diamond level that's unlimited puzzles unlimited analysis all you have to do is exclamation point giveaway highlight a message in chat we go through and uh and do a random number generator to pick who wins the memberships for each week uh, so if you do want to get more into chess, if this inspires you or excites you to uh, to dig into your study, uh, go ahead and enter. Um, and we also have a $500 just for fun amateur tournament uh, this Sunday. So uh, exclamation point arena, if you want to get into that, that's hosted on chess.com uh, in partnership with Outpost. Uh, so both of those are, are ways to, uh, to to get your Josephine on, get your Dina, your, your Casa on, maybe not your Matt on. Uh, <laughs> you want to play like those three, not like me. Um, but, uh, but yeah, Casa back to the games. Yeah. So just, again, just to, you know, we do want to, you know, acknowledge that, you know, they did, they did ultimately wind up taking the match in a really tight one and Nakamura actually did play really recover well after losing you. He actually, st he started to kick it into high gear and he, um, he bested your, your, your Berlin bear teammate, uh, Rasmus Svana in the last round who, um, you know, I, he, he's also, he's, uh, he's half Danish. Um, you know, I, I have, I'm half Danish as well. So I'm always like, oh, he's just playing for Denmark, Germany. Anyways, um, uh, Hakar is black. Uh, and I think this game is really instructive or this snippet I'm showing you because it really just goes to show what you can do when some pieces are in vulnerable spots. And this knight on E3 had kind of been in a, rock in a hard place essentially for you know basically most of the game and what nakamura does the knight was actually really impressive so he starts with queen d4 pinning the knight to the king and there's some real potential threats uh now that this king is tethered to the knight and uh ross was played queen g5 but then e5 happens cementing the queen still putting pressure on the knight here and ross was kind of really concerned about the pin tried to go for a queen trade but actually that didn't really change the boots on the ground because this knight even with the queens off the board struggled to find real estate and so again i'm sorry you have to see this relive this if you know, josephine I'm, i apologize I, i'm i'm kind of sorry i'm not that sorry because it's instructive but you are uh, enjoying it aren't you it's nice chess i mean it's i like i like good stuff it's it's, it's good stuff so anyway so knight c2 okay knight has a home no not quite uh, the knight on c2 is exposed. It's not on b5. It's beautiful. It's not, it's almost like an outpost because there's not an open file to challenge the knight. So it's almost like an outpost in a way. This knight on b5. And this knight on c2 doesn't have that. And so guess where this knight went, Matt? It went to a1. Mm. Oh, <laughs> Arguably the worst square for a knight. Is that is that yeah. fair to say? I mean, they say knights on the rim are dim. Knights on the, in the corner. Um, I'm trying to figure out a rhyme. Knights on in the corner need the coroner. <laughs> I don't know. Like it's just not. They're you just you not have good. been on such a roll with your rhymes so far. Uh, this show, we're gonna give you a pass on that one. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, very impressive job so far. Yeah. Um. So anyway, so nine and a one really just tough tough spot, and it actually basically was there the rest of the game. So, um, the rook moved in, the king improved, the knight stayed lousy. Um, and ultimately that knight went back to a one 
And that was basically the game. You have one bad piece that could tell the story and Nakamura, you know, demonstrated that with devastating effect. I should mention that this knight on A1 still can't go come out of the come out of the corner and go knight c2 because d3 is a devastating fork. And so mm. um so knight c2 d3 is a wrap. And um because of that, uh the knight just stayed in the corner and ultimately after king d5 here, the knight which is still dormant and trapped led to uh Rasmus's resignation and that basically sealed the deal for the 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 uh for the bears because Nakamura ultimately did recover and, and help his team out. But what a match. What a match. What a week. So um, so that was really cool stuff. It looks um, like Josephine just woke Hikaru up, you know, gave that punch after the which, you know, the man realized he he had to do something, you know. He had I, to open his eyes. I love the the, the boxing puns. It, it gave, it gave him that punch. Or that cold shower that Kasa mentioned earlier. Yeah. Hikaru woke up after uh, after Josie's upset. By the way, have you actually ever had like a really cold shower? Because I'm not a fan. Like I've I've voluntarily decided to give it a go. Like, and like they say it's supposed to do something for your body. It was horrifying. Um, I don't recommend it. My chess boxing coach put me into forced me to take the. Uh, oh my gosh, I don't remember how ice it's bath. called. You no, know, it's worse. It's the you know the room, the ice room. I did it. It's. Uh, Hero Proctasy, something like this. Crypto pro no cryo cryo. Oh cryogenic, cryogenic. Cryo cryogenic. It's, it's yeah. cryo. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It was just it was it was very it, it's just like it was a nice room for two minutes and, and a half, right? Two days before the my chess boxing match, you know, mm -hmm. to 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 save the muscles. But yeah, cold shower, no man. I'm putting like the one hundred degrees, you know. I mean, you don't have the same degrees as I do, but yeah. I'm putting like 40 or 45 degrees shower usually. Gotcha. Celsius. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I had a I had a cold shower phase, and it, th there are a lot of benefits. Good for good for waking up in the morning. Good for recovery. Good for uh, you know for men for testosterone release. And uh, but but it's definitely not fun. <laughs> I, I hear you on that. Most chess players don't like mornings, to be honest. At least <laughs> from what I've what I've known of chess players in the past. I don't know, Josephine. Are you a morning? Are you a morning person? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, so you're because you're German. You're you're in the minority. <laughs> you're definitely in the minority for sure. Um, yeah. So, um, anyways, uh, this has been such a pleasure. Uh, we still have um, sort of the PCL fantasy component, but we definitely want to, uh, you know let you go josephine if um if you you gotta you know take off um really really appreciate you coming through uh this was super cool to do and uh we're gonna definitely be keeping an eye on your games in the pcl going forward so no pressure <laughs> Um, and yeah, just saying, saying no pressure <laughs> if before you go you want to uh come down from this this emotional high of reliving this this uh this incredible moment from the pcl we are going to be doing a short relaxation based meditation and breath work mm. uh so you're, you're welcome to join for that you can you can uh go ahead and go on your way i will ask that you just leave the zoom up so that the uh the camera captures don't move <laughs> um so you can turn camera off or whatever but uh but it, please stay in the zoom call if if, uh, if you do decide to, to go on your merry way. Yeah, let's try that meditation thing. Maybe Great. somebody can finally teach me how to do it. Oh, thanks, oh, Josephine. Hey. You're going to give me a company. I wouldn't do it. <laughs> Without right, you. Matt, let's go. Let's let's. What do you got in store for us? Today? Yeah. So this will be a very short uh, meditation practice, just to show you how it's done. Uh, so you can go deeper either on your own practice or come back to my stream. I love doing uh, wellness practices uh, whenever I stream. So um, we're going to be doing two things, and I'll explain the science behind it first. Then we'll practice it together, and then we'll do it on our own. Uh, the, the science behind uh, the the type of breathwork that we're doing is really simple. Um, subconsciously, we're wired to lower our heart rate and exit a fight or flight state when our body starts naturally exhaling longer than we inhale. So if you start thinking about when you recover from a run or you know a, a session on the basketball court or a boxing session, when you're recovering, your body is, is exhaling longer than it inhales, which signals to your central nervous system it's okay to exit fight or flight and it's okay to start to lower the heart rate. So all we're going to do is a, uh, a four, seven, eight breaths. 
So what those numbers mean is we're going to be inhaling for four seconds, holding for seven seconds, and exhaling for eight seconds. We're going to do that for four times together. So if you sit up nice and tall with me, you can stack your shoulders up over your hips, maybe bring your back up off the back of your chair. And if it's comfortable, you can close your eyes so you can focus on the breath. As the eyes shut, it sets off a ripple effect of relaxation through the face, down the spine, your chest and belly relax, uh, and, and you feel yourself settle into regular normal breathing. On your next exhale, you're going to push all the air out. Try to get all the way to empty because I'm going to start counting so that we can do this in sync. So all the air is leaving your lungs and we'll begin our inhale together for one, two, three, four. Hold one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Exhale one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Inhale one, two, three. Four, hold one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Exhale one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Inhale one, two, three, four, hold one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Exhale one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight, last inhale, two, three, four, hold, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, exhale, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, return to normal breathing, keeping eyes closed. We're going to invite in a short visualization. Imagine you're sitting underneath a waterfall. There's heavy water falling on your head and your shoulders, helping you release any kind of tension you're holding on to. Notice how your shoulders can come a little bit further away from their ears. Notice how your tongue can come away from the roof of your mouth. And as this water falls over you, it's also cleansing you. Any kind of negative thoughts, any heaviness that you're carrying around with you that you don't need to. And as you invite in this uh, visualization, maybe pick one thing that you're ready to let go of that you've been hanging on to. Could be a past conversation, could be a future anxiety. When you bring it to mind, with your next exhale, let it leave. And we'll flutter our eyes open. How you guys feeling? Great. It was so helpful. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't do a lot of breathing in and out consciously. Mm -hmm. I think the one thing where I was kind of like unsure was like, you would sometimes be counting to seven and I'd already like exhaled on like three. So I was like, what am I supposed to be doing in the next four seconds or something like that? Mm. But, it's a really good point. It's common. It's common. And I, I, I'm sure a lot of people experience the same thing. So when you start conscious, consciously breathing, you're, you're, you're also kind of, uh, thinking through the endurance of, okay, I need to make this exhale last eight seconds. I can't exhale how I would normally exhale unconsciously, <sighs> dumping all the air. I need to let it go slowly. And when your mind is fully focused on one very simple thing that you normally do subconsciously, it's not thinking about everything else that usually bombards your psyche. You aren't, you aren't thinking all the anxious thoughts. You aren't thinking about what happened yesterday or what's going to happen tomorrow. You're thinking about one thing in the present moment. So even if you get nothing else out of it, like the, the scientific or the biochemical kind of benefits, you're getting the benefit of, of giving your brain a little bit of a reboot, a little bit of a break from all the activity that's usually going on in it. And especially for chess players that are constantly analyzing positions, thinking through when my next stream is or how I'm going to get a collaboration or whatever, it can be good to just take a little bit of a break, reset, uh, let, let yourself de-stress because when you live your life like that, you're constantly in a fight or flight state that takes a toll on your heart on, on uh, your, your mental health and, uh, and, and breaks are, are definitely a good thing. Gotcha. Dean, is that what you're thinking about? What, when, when is, what's your next stream and your, your guest and uh, is yeah, that? Yeah, exactly. Besides, yeah, tomorrow is a big day. I'm hosting a, um, what's the, what's that? Okay, it's hard. I'm, I'm hosting one of the guys from Chasable. So yeah, that's exactly the anxiety that I am uh, having right now. So um, that was a good, you know, moment to take a 
take a break and you know kind of calm down but you know in general and oh yeah we had such a tough weekend right Josephine you know that <laughs> Bundesliga weekend the the game at 9 a.m yesterday was a hard one I saw someone sending a message in chat it's true that you know it's weird to have Josephine today uh with together with me on on a call on the same podcast because we just met like 24 hours ago but cool. uh, yeah, as a chess player, you do have a lot of uh, anxieties and it's very important to practice your meditation and breathing. And I definitely learned that the hard way throughout my chess boxing month preparations. Yeah, I still think it's not possible to breathe out for eight seconds. But, uh... <laughs> <laughs> but if you say so. And I, I don't think it's possible to win a Rook Pawn end game. And it, it, you know, both just take practice and repetition and, uh, and, and believing in it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, again, thank you. Thank you for bearing with us, uh, Josephine, through this, uh, the, 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 all the chess, the guide meditation. And like I said, I, we're going to be, I'm going to, I'm going to, I can only speak for myself. I'm going to be looking at your games on a regular basis. So, um, um, thank you for jumping on my radar because I know, you know, you're someone to follow. So it's, that's really cool. So I appreciate that. And if you do want to follow exclamation point, Josephine and chat, uh, you, you know, you got a lot of new fans from this, uh, this big upset and, and three are on the, the call with you right now, Josephine. So congratulations. Um, and, uh, and, and thanks for, uh, thanks to both of you for staying up late with us. Uh, I, I know it's late over in, in Europe. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thanks that you invited me. It was a lot of fun. And for all in the chat who want to see me suffer tomorrow during Title Tuesday, just come on to our Twitch channel. And uh, it's always a lot of suffering. But if you enjoy that. <laughs> Josephine, are you handling that channel on your own or you have colleagues together with you? Uh, no, Lara is still with me. And Elizabeth is on the picture. <laughs> Um, the picture it's important that's what was my question yeah and I'm, it's as long as she's in the picture it's already great yeah um but yeah we're basically two who are streaming nice good good luck tomorrow for title tuesday thanks thanks <laughs> okay see you sometime i hope yeah see Bye -bye. You, Josephine. thanks again um, and, and Dina, while we transition to uh, fantasy, do you want to talk more about um, what is happening with uh, and I'll, I'll fix the uh, the camera here. She just left the call. But uh, what what is happening with um, the Chessable stream tomorrow? Yeah, so basically I have an honor and a pleasure to host as uh, Trim is helping me out geared. Is that the correct pronunciation? Uh, one of the guys behind Chessable tomorrow on my Twitch channel right after Title Tuesday, in fact, at 7.30 Central European 7.30 p.m. Central European. We are going to talk about, uh, in general, what what are the updates and new features in Chessable, you know, together with them uh, moving uh, on the same direction with chess.com. I'm so excited to, you know, to know some juicy details. Well, I don't think I'll get the information about what was the offer deal and stuff like that, but definitely what are the plans uh, for, for the nearest future and as... Um, Trim helping me out here in chat. Yeah, 1B3, Adiban course, I believe. Uh, I'll definitely do my homework and prepare questions on that one. And, and yeah, in general, looking forward, I believe it's going to be one of the very, very cases when I host a conversation and a discussion. I'm going to be just you guys today. Well, the only difference is that tomorrow I'm going to be the host and not the guest. I'm sure you'll do great. You got a lot of streaming experience. You know, you're you got you 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 practiced with us. Not that you needed it. So you 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 exactly. you're doing, you 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 got you you got back. We we acclimatized you to you know what you're gonna do tomorrow. So you know, well, you'll be fine. You'll be gonna be great. And uh, I'm I'm definitely gonna um, tune in as well because I don't know a lot about Gert and. Um, and uh and how chessable came to be and i work at chess.com now so i uh i ought to learn some of these things so um all right so uh matt how are we doing on the on the pcl predictions we got we got do we we have them because we can actually do a very quick uh uh or we don't have to do a run through actually last week let's just acknowledge that you won last week congratulations um 
you know, I'm going to give you a brief, you know, I'm going to give you a golf clap um, <laughs> because I'm not thrilled you're, about you're really, it. Um, you're really cheering for luck at this point. You know, you know far more you know, about chess than I do, but I'll, I'll take it. I'll take, I'll you know, take what in, I can get. March, March Madness, you know, college basketball, they say, you know, you don't even have to watch the games. Your grandma could, you know, fill out the, the bracket <laughs> and, and, and do better than the person that watched the games. And respectfully, I'm, I'm being a little. <laughs> you call me a grandma, but, Come on. But, res but respectfully, <laughs> you beat me, and I know more about these players than you do. What the you heck? Have, you what absolutely do. That like, means you gotta take your revenge. That means anyone can play. So if you're in chat, uh, exclamation point fantasy gets you over to uh, the PCL predictions, the prizes. Uh, and, and, uh, Casa, did you send the week two Google form? I have the one and then I, I have the prizes that we can switch to now. Um, yeah, but so, I, I don't so, have the week two Google form, uh, like, like we had for last week. Yeah. All right. Hold, give me one second. I'm sure, going to send I'll you right up, now. You I'll got it right here. The prizes. Um, so okay. you can check out, uh, you know, everything that, uh, the, the PCL prediction contest, uh, entails. Um, so uh, the, the way that you play, um, let's see. Oh, here's week two. It's it's in uh, what what we linked to in the chat. No, no worries, Casa. I found it. We're good. Okay, cool. Um, so you just enter in uh, your email. Um, you do your chess.com username. Mine's moving with Matt. And then you uh, you can enter into this interactive prediction uh, that we do every week as a uh, a fantasy uh, competition and giveaway. Uh, via chess.com and the professional chess league. So, uh, so are we, are we about to do this together? Yeah, Maybe let's do time? it together. We're just going to, cool. Dina, you can also, uh, get in the act here. You don't have to file the form right this second, but we'll just we'll yeah. go over the, the choices and we'll just, we'll see what we got. We, we did a quick rundown last week. We were, we were in agreement with most things. Um, except, uh, I picked the, the, I think like one of the, the over unders Matt caught me on and, uh, he definitely chose the right team because I had the Cobras beating the chess bras and, you know, we saw what happened there. So um, there was a, uh, there was a little bit of a tiebreaker there and he, he wound up winning, but uh, I'm going to get him this week. So first question, first question, Matt, what will be the smallest margin of victory in week two? So over one and a half or under one and a half? I mean, after seeing week one and seeing how uh, things shook, shook out and, and seeing how close some of the matchups are going into, uh, you know, extra innings, if you will, or, or, or tie-breaking rounds, uh, I'm going to go with under 1.5 again. Yeah, I'm going to go under 1.5 as well. Like, I think that's kind of like, like a no-brainer. Although, Dina, you disagree. Do you think there's going to be a match that ends more than one and a half? Like, with the, do you think there's going to be a match that isn't uh less than one and a half no i don't think so i mean it's just yeah not not doesn't sound realistic to me okay yeah all right so that that because basically less than one and a half basically means one right so so uh i think they'll probably be like a nine a nine seven somewhere so yeah all right next one what do we what will be the largest margin of match victory in week two um i think like, well, this week, the largest margin of victory was, was five. It was eight and a half, three and a half. And that was kind of shocking to me. Hmm. Um, I'm, I'm going to go under five and a half. I don't think there's going to be an over five and a half point blowout. Like that seems crazy to me. Yeah, no, 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 no. You know, those, the thing is like, all those teams are just so strong. And it's, it's kind of hard to expect something that massively, you know, uh, destroyable. Yeah, I Maybe think we're on a, a, in agreement yeah. on this one. So, uh, yeah, all, all the all, all the teams seem super strong. It's it's pretty unlikely in my mind too that we see a, a big blowout. All right, how many games will start with one v three in week two? Ooh, that's a juicy one. Ooh. Um, I'd say at least three. At least three. How many games were? I see. I wish I had the stat in front of me. How many games were with b three in week one? Because to me. I don't know. Like, I feel like B3, there was this renaissance with Audubon and the course and everything. And then people start to prepare against it. And they were like, yeah, I know I'm not, shouldn't be going B3 anymore, but over. So basically that over one and a half would be two games, two out of 128. Yeah. So I'm going to bet the odds on this one. I'm going to say over 1.5. I'm going to be a contrarian and say oh. under, but I, okay. I, I honestly am going to regret this. I know it. <laughs> I know it. All right, how many games with the Nimzo Indian defense will there be in week two? 
Okay, this. Oh, that's gonna be a, a lot of games. It just can't be uh, like under two point five. Yeah, I would say over. I think I think Vegas set the line wrong here. <laughs> okay, just think... just question: How do you put this half a point when it comes to like to number of games? So there isn't so a tie. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Well, so so, so if it's two, do you win or lose? You know, then it would have to be three. So it just makes it uh, makes it clear. Wait, 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 wait. No, no. So to me, I think of I think of the half numbers as like is it's like it's it's over or under. So if it's two and a half, it's you set it a half number, so it's a whole number. So it's like mm -hmm. if it's oh. over two and a half, it's oh, it's three. It's at least three, uh, right? That's wow. that's the point. So it's to avoid the confusion that two is to including in under two, right or not? Correct. Wow, yeah. that's so smart. Jesus Christ, who invented that? Dina, you you got to if you just spend some time in America and then you start betting on sports, these lines <laughs> that is so very common. readily apparent to you. Yeah. So, they, they, <laughs> that's how to do it in sports. I'm not so. as sure in European countries it's allowed in some of the European countries. Gambling, really? All right. I don't, I don't, I don't, we'll have to get. I'll have to get back to you on that because I feel there's some. Yeah. There's definitely money going, exchanging hands in some of these European countries, especially in like Premier League. A lot uh, of friends bet oh, on football. Yeah. 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 All right. Ooh, this is an interesting one. How many games will the Gotham Knights board one win in Week Two? So, mm -hmm. um, let That's me actually. Hikaru. Yeah. So, let me actually just check just to verify. Um, but. Uh, in week two, who is going to be the board one? Because will will Hikaru be playing? That's the that's the question. Oh, interesting. I'm gonna verify right now and see. Uh, so I have it up, and it does say uh, the board one is Hikaru Nakamura, and yeah. they're playing against the California Unicorns. Okay. Um. So so yeah, we're betting on uh, Hikaru to win all four games, basically. Hmm. Who's there? Wow. Who's the Who's the board one for uh, the California with this it's week? It's Sam Shankland, uh, Ray Robson, Chris Yu, and Zoe Town. No, no way is he getting. He, uh, he's not get. He's not getting four this week. Uh, respectfully, he's gonna. He's gonna see the draw. <laughs> he's gonna see the draw to Sam or to Robson, who are both both capable, uh, very capable grandmasters, particularly in that format. So, um, I'm gonna uh, say under. We we yeah, have a diet. Agree with you on this one. We have another diversion here. All right, it gets interesting. I'm gonna I'm gonna bet on psychology here. He has been uh, in some ways uh, embarrassed or exposed to the chess world in the same way that he came back with a vengeance and won his next three games after Josie's. I think he's gonna be taking uh, every PCL game much more seriously and, and really wants to show out. So I think he's gonna win all four games this week. You got a point, Matt. You got a point. We'll see what happens. All right, we're getting uh, to our segment, uh, which I which I love. We we should have uh, harped on our name for this segment that you covered at the beginning of the show, Casa, the brilliant or blunder, because we had some oh. great great brilliant moves this this week. We also had some some pretty bad blunders or mouse slips, uh, but we got the uh, the brilliant exclamation points here. How many brilliant moves will Blitz play in week two? Over three point five or under? So I. Over how many have you dina have you had brilliant moves have, do you see brilliant moves a lot when you're playing on just.com because i feel like the like it's hard to get a brilliant move right i see brilliant moves when i play my own classical games you know so if i can make brilliant um, moves then why others cannot and those are grand monsters so for sure there will be a lot of brilliant moves so this isn't just the on the blitz on just the blitz team this is not like through the league this is just that one team um, well, it doesn't matter, you know, when it's brilliant move, it can be just like, you know, two, three moves tactic that, that just is way too beautiful that is just like the strongest. So it, I think it's a natural thing to get a brilliant move. I mean, I might be exaggerating. Feel free to contradict me. That's what we are here for. I'm going to give the over just because I'm looking at who's playing for the Blitz this week. And it's Grishchuk, MVL, Lachno, and Bakrell. So... Uh, oh, Alexandra Bakro. I actually not. I actually thought it was going to be Etienne Bakro, but it's another Bakro. Oh, it must uh, be his son, no? I I have no. I, I'm flying blind on Alexan, Alexandra Alexandra Bakro. I've never heard of this. This. Wait, uh, where do player. you see him? Um, I am looking at the week two matchups, uh, kind of off off screen, if you will. But yeah, oh yeah. But yes, yeah, the the week two. Um, 
So, uh, but yeah, but honestly, Lachno, very strong player, Katarina yeah. Lachno, Alexander Kristrup. By the way, we should mention, I think they're one of two couples in the PCL uh, because uh, uh, Grishchuk and Lachno are Who's together, the second if I'm not couple? mistaken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're married and with kids. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so um, I, I, th I think there's one other, uh, but I'll have to I'll have to circle back to to verify that. But that's pretty cool. But partners, they'll probably be playing from the same spot in the league. Uh, so that'll be interesting. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll give the over. All right. So we're, uh, we're, we're betting on brilliance this week. Uh, so, okay. Next one. How many decisive games will occur between Norway gnomes and uh, Levitov chess wizards over 11 and a half or under? Mm. And, and Casa, do you mind uh, just reminding our, our viewers, what does it mean when it says decisive game? What yeah. So decisive game is, is something where the game does not end in a draw. It's a win or a loss. So, um, there's 16 games theoretically in a match if it doesn't go to tie breaks. So the over would be 12 there and the under would be 11. So if you think they're going to be 12 out of the 16 games would not be draws, uh, then you would say take the over. Um, I haven't seen a ton of draws in, um, in a lot of these matches. Um, I mean, there's some. Uh, it's like it, it is right on the cusp. I'm going to say I'm actually going to say the under just because. I think there will be some some draws in the evenly rated matchups. Um, so I'm, I'm going to say under, but it's going to be close. Yeah, it might be recency bias uh, because uh, Josie had those those two draws in her uh, in her uh, four games this week that we covered. Um, but yeah, I, I could see uh, I could see under eleven and a half uh, games being draws as well. All right, how many wins will the Garden State Passers? score in week two so the garden state passers let me refresh our memories here yep pulling it up on screen so uh so people can check it out too they they lost to the levitov chess wizard six to like 10 to six in the first match so they definitely didn't win um uh respectfully they i don't think they won five uh Five and a half. They didn't win six games, right? So, gotcha. Um, I'm gonna, man. I'm gonna. I hate to do this, but I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna give them the under. I need. To, I need to. To me, it's a show and tell dynamic. You have to show me before I, you know. Believe. It's like it's like Just relationships. Do it. I mean, it's go it's like relationships. You gotta show. You gotta show <laughs> you me. You gotta something. feel good about it. Just do it. Well, I you think we're, show me something we're before I bring bring my all to the table. You know what I'm saying? You gotta show go me. Go for it. We're splitting here too, and I hate to do it because of the the Cinderella story that we have. But they are up against the Spanish Maniac Shrimps this week, who came into the tournament as qualifier winners. Uh, so uh -huh. I'm gonna bet that uh, Garden State wins over 5.5 uh, against the our, our friends, the Shrimps. Okay. Okay. All right. All right, how many queens will the Canada Chess Bras sacrifice in week two? You're just betting on if they sacrifice a queen or not. Uh, so it's over 0. 0.5 or under 0. 0.5. Will there be at least one qu queen sacrifice this week in the 16 games that the Chess Bras play? I'm going to be a pessimist here. Is, is Carlson aware that, you know, he's expected to sack a queen here? Because I think if he <laughs> knew of the odds, he, he could adjust accordingly. It. Yeah, but yeah, he would have done it for sure. And he yeah. would have won the game, which is even more frustrating. <laughs> but but until he until he is more made aware of our show, I think he's just going to play his normal calm, cool and collected grind it down type of approach. And so. I'm kind of thinking, you know, you know, the honestly, Jennifer Yu can play very sharp chess. Um, and so um I wouldn't put it past her, to be honest. Um, to I, I've seen I've seen her play up close and she can she can do some things. And that's the queen sacrifice that I'm gonna go under. I, I'm gonna play the optimist here and and uh, everyone loves a queen sacrifice. I would love to see one so I'm I'm just betting on what I hope happens because uh, because I'd love to be able to cover that next week. Uh, all right, next up we got how many games will last less than 19.5 moves in week two? So under 20 moves uh, is that gonna be over one and a half or under one and a half? 
I'm going to be the optimist here and just hope that that there that's there's under that there aren't uh, that there's only one game less than 19 moves because I don't want to see any Berlin repetitions. <laughs> I don't want to I don't want to see the queen e4 queen d4 check thing, the queen e4 queen e6 queen d4 queen d6 dynamic. And I, I, I no no thank you. I want nice fighting games. So I'm going to optimistically take the under. I think if you want to be like objective for sure statistically there's going to be more than one game under 19 moves. All right, fine Dina, you know, just uh, put the put the all right, all right. <laughs> uh so I'm going to play the statistics with with team Dina. We got another divergence making things interesting here. Uh, so, uh, we'll go to this next page here. So I, I love these, uh, you know, these, these like, uh, enters. So, um, what, what will be the biggest upset in week two? And I'll go ahead and pull up on screen, uh, and, and we can just scroll through together what the matchups are here. So in week two, we have the Canada chess bras against the Indian yogis. We have the Brazil capybaras against the Charlotte Cobras. We have Norway gnomes against the Levitov chess wizards, the garden state passers versus the Spanish maniac shrimps. The Shanghai Tigers against the Blitz. The St. Louis Archbishops against Team MGD1. Berlin Bears against Croatia Bulldogs. Gotham Knights against the California Unicorn. So what is the, going to be the biggest upset uh, in those matchups? So if you, let's actually just, we can actually just dovetail the matchups then with this biggest upset and just, and, and do a quick rundown there. Sure. It, can you go back to the page with the, the matchups? I see Vi Vaishali. I have such high respect for her game that I feel like she's going to win her board. Like as far as board fours are concerned, like she's one of the best in the business. And so uh, to me, I feel like she's going to win that matchup consistently. Um, I could see the yogis beating the chess bras this week. Um, wow. I, I hate to pick against the chess bras two weeks in a row. Like I'm definitely <laughs> going to get the vitriol of their fans. Um, but I have that much respect for Vaishali that I think, I mean, we saw her, you know, essentially crush a GM in one of our snippets earlier today. So um, I'm going to, I'm going to take, that's going to be the upset for me. Um, although actually their, their rating, their average rating or adjusted rating is actually really close. That's, that wouldn't even be the biggest upset. So, um, but I'm going to pick that. My, that's my upset of the week. I guess that's understandable. I won't argue on this one. Okay. All okay. Right. Well, so, so the yogis that. over the chess bras. Um, okay. And, and, and is it, a, uh, just for clarification, is it uh, a specific matchup? Uh, like one person versus one person, or is it a team over a team for what constitutes the the upset in this uh, in this question? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, let me let me actually. Uh, I'm gonna I'm looking at this the sheet again. Let me read the. Can you go back so I can read that question again? And then maybe yeah, I it, can it would out. definitely. It just simply says what what will be the biggest upset in week two? I think I think betting on the team uh, would would be. A, a good way to go about it uh, yeah. and requires a lot less knowledge for each individual player and matchup. Uh, Cause I, I feel like pretty oh. much everyone would get it wrong. <laughs> I'm reading. So, so I was reading the internet wrong. They literally as a description up there. It says this week, you have to answer what the biggest upset will be with the teams and the upset score. So the biggest upset is based on the score. Okay, it's not the so actual team score. Got it. Thank. Oh, really? Yeah. Perfect. Thanks for that clarification. Yeah, that so, makes sense. so still picking the the yogis as a team over the chess bras as a team uh, with oh man with that individual. So, I'm that's all right. So the biggest upset score to me then I'm gonna go eight and a half. No, not eight and a half. I'm gonna go. Nine seven nine seven, so that's that's at sixteen games, right? So nine sets is going to be two point spread there. Gotcha. So we we say uh, we say the score. So nine yeah. seven is the biggest upset. So that okay. Um, I'm going to go eight and a half and seven and a half. That's that's definitely smarter. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Data? You, know, you got it. You got. What do you think? Do you, do you think there's going to be an upset? Or are you are you where are you on that? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, for sure, for sure, absolutely. All right. Well, there you have it then. Um, we, uh, we're we going to see who, who, who wins this week. Um, 
Uh, I'm going to actually, I didn't fill out, I actually did it with you live on air last week, but I didn't actually fill out the form. So I'm going to actually figure out how many I got last, uh, right this week. And then we can actually compare. And, uh, as you know, I see trim in the, in the, in the chat here saying it says in the form, read the rules. Yeah, but I, I was reading, I was not reading. So um, wait, wait, that was fast. Wait, wait, that was very fast. You just went for, for Canada chess in a second. Um, yeah, so so that was the same question. Uh, that's what? at the end of week one as well. It's like like cover what it, team Turkey. are you what team are you supporting? Maybe and it, it just you doesn't. You saw the games and then you got disgust, you know. By oh, okay. Whatever. I'm gonna stick but with you, the... the way you saw Magnus playing against the Wonder. Maybe you got disgust. Maybe you're now rooting, you know, for Cobras. <laughs> it, it's possible, yeah. So, so are you changing yours up from the Cobras, uh, Casa? I'm sticking with the chess pros this week. Yeah, no, as a as a Cobra alum alumnus, you know, I have a duty and responsibility to support, yeah, just like a, someone in the Premier League supports their club. Like I have to support. So, um, so yeah, don't let me down this week, guys. And uh, and and because Chess Bra is a, is a friend of the channel and, and you know close with with Amon after chess boxing and and after seeing how they performed in in in, uh, in week one, I'm sticking with the Chess Bras. Oh. All right. Well, I think we're this actually is, is, a, is a good way to close out the show. Um, Dina, it, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I know it's midnight where you are, so I really appreciate it. Um, you know, it was a, it was a pleasure to you know get to know you a little bit virtually and talk about these games. I really appreciate it. I know Matt and Matt and I definitely did. Um, and uh, yeah, have a good uh, stream tomorrow with Gert. Definitely folks tune into that because uh, you'll get to meet the founder of Chessable um, and definitely tune into these games. I mean, really part of the reason we do this show is because we love the chess and the games and uh, there are there are matchups Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of this week. So we we're like your appetizer, and then you get nice entrees Tuesday to Friday. Where do you get that? Where do you get that? I don't know. Ooh. So uh, enjoy that. And uh, Matt, I'll, I'll leave you with the Matt and Dina. I'll leave you folks with the final word. Love it. Well, well exclamation so point, much. Dina in chat. If you want to support Dina, uh, her Twitch is linked there. If you want to check out her stream with Chessable tomorrow. Uh, and, and reminder to, uh, do your fantasy picks. Um, you can, you can win, uh, part of the, the, uh, you know, the, the prize pool that, uh, chess.com has set aside for this, uh, reminder to highlight a chat in uh, a hi highlight a message in chat. If you want a chance at winning a diamond membership with chess.com and a chess tournament with a $500 prize pool for all levels separated by levels. So you aren't playing against Dina on Sunday, uh, is this okay. Sunday exclamation point arena. Uh, and you can enter and and potentially win five hundred dollars. But Dina, anything else to uh, to share to plug before we we call it? Well, guys, it's been an honor and a pleasure being here. Thank you so much for the invite. Really appreciate it. And Casa, uh, is that correct? You me pronouncing your name, Casa? Yeah, Casa. Mi Casa su Casa. You know. All right. Nice. So um, half Danish, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, it was a very, uh, very special occasion finally to meet, and I am looking forward to to be joining you guys uh, more and uh, collabing in the future. Totally enjoyed that. Uh, I really, really love the vibe and the energy you guys rock. Lots of uh, lots of luck for your upcoming shows and the coverage of the Pro Chess League of uh, this new 2023 season. Thanks so Thank much, you. Dana. Um, and Dina, are you are you going to bed? Or are you planning on streaming? Happy to happy to raid if you're hopping on. Uh, well, listen, my sister has a birthday today. Uh, oh, let's birthday looking raid. For a channel to raid, although it is, uh, I'm gonna send you the channel in the chat. But you do not have to. Uh, you absolutely do not have to. No, happy to. She's, not doing, little... she's not doing chess, although right now. So feel free to to, to navigate yourself. But. Uh, <laughs> I am going to bed, but Fox would love to see you uh, uh, in chat tomorrow and uh, keep in touch. Peace. All right. Take care. And um, and yeah, we're going to raid uh, Dina's sister. Is it Asia? Am I Asa. Yeah, Asa. that's great. Asa. Asa. Oh, it's like it, like Casa with the, with the, without the K. Yeah, it's, Asa. You know, it says Asa. It's like Asia. Ah, uh, Asia. But, okay. Yeah, but feel free. Yeah, feel free. She's still streaming, so she's been there on the seven hour stream, and uh, oh yeah, wow. she's yeah, uh, she's gonna be impressed. And Matt, she knows you. You know you her so. 
Yeah, yeah, we've we've uh, interacted virtually a few times. She's always been super, super nice. Um, and and we'd love to go jump over and wish her a happy birthday. So guys in chat, get your happy birthday messages ready. Uh, we're going to jump over uh, in about 10 seconds. So uh, go ahead and, and load up. Uh, you can get some some Matt Cat hearts or some some cat boxers in the chat too if you want to. Uh, send some of our, our emojis over there and, uh, and y'all, thank you so much for joining for, uh, for week one, uh, of the PCL with, uh, the checkout show. Dina, thanks again for joining and it's raid time. Let's go drop on in. Uh, y'all have a great rest of your night. Thanks a lot, guys. Talk to you later by messages. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.